Hey, what's up? My name is PJ, and you are listening to the Music Photo Podcast, session number seven. Thank you for joining us for yet another episode of the Music Photo Podcast. My name is PJ Pantelis. I'll be your host for today. You can find me on Twitter at PJPANTELIS. Today's episode is an absolute doozy. It features Max Fairclough, who's a Perth-based music photographer. Max is an absolute breath of fresh air. This is the longest session we've had by far, but not deliberately, only because the conversation was so organic and authentic and honest, which I really, really appreciate. To give you a bit of background, Max works regularly nationally and internationally with a lot of really high-level bands. Um, for example, he tours with Bring Me Horizon, Crossfaith. He's just completed an Australian tour with Vance Joy. He's done commercial work for Qantas Airlines, Universal Music, SJC Custom Drums, and he's the head photographer at Hysteria Magazine. You're going to want to stick around to the very end for this one as we discuss a whole bunch of cool stuff, including investing in yourself and funding your own tours to help your career, finding your niche, working your way up from the bottom, always looking to the next level, how to light band promos, and even how to travel the world with a portrait with a a strobe lighting kit. As always, the show notes can be found at bigpantsphoto.com slash podcast. This is going to be quite a long episode, so sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy it. Max, what's up, man? Thank you so much for joining me this morning. Ah, yes. Uh, thank you for having me, Pentelis. I'm good. How are you? I'm excellent. What have you been working on so far today? Um, honestly, not a whole lot. Uh, I'm actually, for the first time ever, working on a video um, I'm putting together for a client, uh, which is interesting because I'm not a videographer at all. Yep. And uh, my friends that are giving me a little bit of shit for it. But I've uh, had to put together a video. Um, so I'm struggling right now, going on the YouTube, looking at tutorials. Yeah, um, learning as you go. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. It's kind of fun. Like it's, um, I, I like learning new things. So for me, this is a whole lot of fun. Uh, I've certainly not uh, edited videos with my own footage before. So this is a, uh, this is a totally new experience. Yep. So, um, yeah, I'm just compiling that right now. I've been stressing out over it the last weekend, trying to put together something just to, uh, release for over Easter. Yeah. And, uh, but, but it's been good. Like I've got some good friends over East that are into the whole video game. So I've been sharing my content with them and letting them, Sorry, showing them my work and uh, seeing what they think and, you know, the feedback's been positive right now. So, fingers crossed. Yeah, but, uh, excellent. Video, it's it's a whole other beast because I'm sure, I know with uh, personally, with me personally, when I edit my photos, I can put on my music and just kind of switch off. Whereas with video, you have to be so alert all the time. Yeah, to be honest, like I'm just playing this one song over again. I've only just built 45 seconds of video and I hate the fucking song. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so mind my language, by the way. That's um, okay. um, yeah, uh, look, video is not my thing. I'm not going to pretend I'm a videographer. I'm horrible at it. Uh, photography is my niche, and I'm going to stick to it. But you know, sometimes your client, uh, you, you go on tour with someone. I'm a music photographer. If you go on tour with someone, sometimes they want some video. And in this case, they wanted some video. And if I said no, well, then they probably would have looked uh, in a different direction. Yep. So I said yes, nod my head, wanted the job. And now I'm putting together a video. Uh, that hopefully doesn't look like it was created in uh, iMovie or something of the sort. So. I'm sure you'll nail it. I'm sure you've got the eye and I'm sure you know what looks good and what you've seen that looks good. So I'm sure there are no issues there. Yeah, let's hope so. Um, so what other things have you been working on of recent times? I know there's probably some stuff you can't talk about, but what, um, um, what mean, have you been doing lately? I mean, everything's pretty open. So I've just come off to a, a, with a solo artist. Um, so that was kind of interesting. Uh, pretty much all that requires is, you know, a document on a day-to-day basis. Uh, you know, uh, what, what they do during the day, going out to lunch, shooting the show, behind the scenes, all that sort of stuff. Yep. Um, but most of those photos are done on the day. So uh, I'd shoot the day, document them, shoot the show, go back to the hotel, edit the photos, uh, put it in a Dropbox, send it to the manager and the band. And then wake up the next day and, you know, I'm done with that. So um, really right now all I'm doing is kind of just sitting at home and um, watching a whole lot of porn. So uh, <laughs> to, be, to be honest. <laughs> Thank you for your uh, but, brutal uh, honesty. But, uh, you know, I've actually got, you know, uh, I've got not much on. So I just sit at home when I'm at home, uh, do nothing. Uh, you know what? I'm always stuck to my computer. I'm always sending emails. So um, yeah. 
I guess I'm working in a way because I'm always trying to get more work. So keeping that email game up and um, just talking shit on Facebook, really. Nice. So, yeah. Um, who who was it that you've been on tour with? Are you like uh, to say? So yeah, 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 of course. Uh, so it's a solo artist called Vance Joy. Um, which is, if if anyone's familiar with my work, is a bit uh, different to what I usually shoot. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, you know what? I think with different artists come different manner, uh, mannerisms. And I think, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm always looking to create different photographs. So uh, it, it was something I definitely wanted to uh, make happen. Um, and, yeah, you know, it was a good tour. And I had a lot of fun and I like make, making new friends. So, uh, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, excellent. Vance Troy's from Melbourne. Uh, yes, he is from Melbourne. Uh, I think he was originally from Sydney. Don't quote me, but uh, yeah, he, he's living in Melbourne now. Um, and the rest of the band also from Melbourne as well. Okay, so cool. Vance Joy is actually uh, it's a solo artist called it's a sol- one person called James, but he's created um, he's created a band to perform live with, kind of like City in Color if you're familiar. Sure. With. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, they're all based in Melbourne, so it's all relatively um, pretty local. Excellent. Well, if you're you know, heading out, if you're branching out from heavy music, that sounds like a pretty sweet one to have under your belt, like Triple J, Hottest 100, number one artist. Yeah. That's, it's, that's a pretty big deal, man. Uh, it's all very strategic. Like, uh, I, tours like that always have their reasons. So, like, for, for that one, like, uh, for, for me, I've always wanted to try and branch out and shoot different artists as well. There, there's, you know, I, I want to create different photographs, but for me to jump out and shoot someone like Vance Joy is always... Uh, very strategic. It creates new opportunities. You're working with different people. Yeah. Uh, it's very endless, and it's no like the guys just uh, got the main support for Taylor Swift's World Tour. Wow. So there's probably uh, no surprises that I probably tried to jump at that. But you know, yeah, we'll see what happens. But um, yeah, it's always good to work with different artists and not just the the artists that you're uh, stuck in. You know, stuck usually shooting. Um, and and you know, if you have a portfolio and you want to try and build a website of photographs that you love and you want to present to new clients, it it certainly helps to show that you can shoot more than just uh, dudes wearing tight pants with dark lipstick sitting in an alleyway, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. So the, um, I guess that's a, that's a good connection to have. Is that in the regard of, uh, you know, starting out in a, in a different part of the industry, has it been sort of like starting again with whole new managers and labels and just like a whole different, um, group of people that you're working with? Uh, you know what? It, it kind of is. And sometimes it's really difficult because, uh, I mean, it's so funny. The industry is so small. The music industry is very tiny. Everyone knows everyone. But you don't I'm, – I'm very familiar with the rock and roll hardcore scene. Like all the managers know everyone, all the labels. Everyone knows everyone. So to contact someone and want to work with a different band on a different label is really not that hard because you have a portfolio of bands – that that management or label is familiar with. And they go, okay, look, this guy has some sort of credentials against his name. He, his work does all right, you know, whatever. Let, let's take this guy on board and let's discuss making touring a uh, possibility or let's discuss making a photo shoot happen. Yeah. But when you work with, uh, say, like an indie artist or something completely different, um, sometimes the person on the other end looking at the email is not familiar with the artists they work at. They might have to do a bit of research, but you just have to sell it to them. Yeah. Um, in this case, I was very fortunate because uh, Vance Joy, James, is under uh, Unified. Which, okay. you know, which holds like, you know, the Amity Afflictions, the park, uh, not the Parkway, sorry, the Amity Afflictions, the North Lane. And, you know, a lot of those bands obviously I have under my belt. So for me to approach um, James's manager and be like, hey, look, uh, I'd be interested in uh, going on tour with him or I'd be interested in taking his photograph. There was no blurred lines there. You know, they're, they're aware of the work that I produced. So it was an easy happening. Yeah, but, you've already got uh, their label behind you. For, for sure. Uh, but, you know, if I, if I were to approach another indie artist, which I haven't tried yet, but, you know, fingers crossed, um, you'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. But, uh, you know, you just really got to sell it to other artists. I mean, I actually hit up, um, there's, uh, there's an Australian pop, pop band or whatever you call it called Five Seconds of Summer. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm aware of them. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, <laughs> I mean, if you don't now, then you're living under a big rock. Yeah. Yeah, I actually approached them to do some sort of touring work with them just to open up, you know, open up some new work and yeah. we got into discussion and I hit up their manager and, you know, I really sold it to them to try and make something happen. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, sometimes the real victory is just getting a response in an email. So when you get a response, you, you've obviously sold it to them that you're doing something well. So uh, at the end of the day, you can shoot rock bands and whatever and you can approach anyone you want. Just, you know, have, have some sort of credentials in your work and, you know, have some sort of... Uh, I mean, just have a credit to your name by the value of your work. 
Yeah. So um, you, you can get whatever job you want. You just have to sell it right. I find that so interesting because by the sounds of it, you're someone who is happy or not happy, but you're okay with hearing the word no a few times. Uh, well, the thing is, I, I think people, uh, I, I mean, people take it hard if they don't get a response and I understand as well, but you know, for every 20 emails, I get one response. So you, you do get, her- well, you don't even hear no's, you just get a blank answer. Yeah. So when I, when I first started emailing bands and managers trying to get work, you know, I, w- I would send out an email and I'd hear nothing back from them. Uh, I would absolutely punish their inbox. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, I'd start hearing work. I'd start getting work back and I'd, I'd be able to build a portfolio. People started giving me chances and opportunities. And, you know, the, the very first people that gave me chances and opportunities now I'm very loyal to and, you know, they've given me a lot of work. And, you know, what, what, when you start getting a lot of work and you get start giving those opportunities, you learn how to const- uh, write your emails. You learn how to structure them. You, you learn how to write them in a way that deserves a response or triggers a response and doesn't go straight to the... Uh, the trash can, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, if you are an emerging photographer and you know you're sending out emails and you're not getting responses, then you know you have to look at it two things: uh, one, how you're structuring your emails, and two, you know, don't take it personally because chances are they did get your email, but it's a no. And the politest way of saying no is just not responding at all. Of course. So, yeah, that's uh, that, that's uh, that's a common struggle. And you know, what? I like I said, for every twenty emails, I get one response. So whatever. Yeah, I love that. Well, I've come from a business background at uni and one of the things that they sort of drill into you is that if you want to get that yes, like you've just got to get the no's out and as quickly as possible, you've got to get through all the no's to get the yes. So sometimes you've, yeah, not got to, you've got to not be afraid to hear no or get no responses, but that's, that's a way of testing you. That's a way of separating the boys from the men. They're definitely, and you know, there are trials and tribulations you have to go through in order to get the things you want. So, you know, part of that's the process and, you know, you just, you know, whatever, you scratch the emails, you get some, you don't, whatever. And then when you get the opportunities, you grab it by the balls and you fucking do a good job of it. So, yep. uh, I mean, it's just that. <laughs> okay. Cool, man. Let's move along a little bit. Um, I was on your website earlier going through your stuff and obviously very impressed, but um, your client list is long and I was surprised to see that it looks like you have some commercial clients as well as um, music industry based clients. Can yeah, you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, I can. Uh, it, it's certainly interesting. Um, I, I guess, uh, well, without without sounding like a big douchebag, like I'm always trying to think five years ahead of myself. So I'm always, uh, I'm never comfortable with where I'm at. So uh, right now, uh, I'm a music photographer. I, I love the people I photograph. I want to be the people I photograph. You fall in love with your subjects. Pretty yep. standard. But I mean, if I'm going to be smart about it, uh, you know, music photography is probably not going to pay the bills. And I, I, I mean, I have big plans. Like I'm always wanting to create big photographs and like I want to do photo shoots that have big budgets. They're just dreams. So for me to, to have those sort of, um, sort of dreams happen, I've got to shoot in a different direction and it's not music. Uh, it'd be more commercial. So for me, last year I approached a few different big businesses and um, uh, you know companies to try and make some work happen, um, just behind closed doors. And you know I'll, I've been able to get some jobs. I won some competitions that have actually enabled me to work with some sort of clients. So last year uh, I actually won this stupid uh, travel competition um, with Qantas Airways, and I ended up getting some work through Qantas, which is uh, I remember that photo. Cool. Yeah, yeah. So that was uh, wild. And then I did uh, some photo work. That competition also enabled me to get some work with uh, uh, WA Tourism. So, I mean, you, you, you can shoot on a commercial level. It's just how you have to approach it. Um, I only have a small select, uh, small clientele base of commercial work, but I'm definitely going to be looking down that direction in the next two years um, just because I, 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 I want to think about the long term. And, you know, I have dreams, I have goals, I want to open up a studio. Uh, you know, if I have a family or something like that, I want to pay for it. Um, I don't want to be on the road away from home, um, you know. So uh, commercial is definitely something I'm going to go down. But uh, for now, it's it's relatively small and I'm just focusing on the music. Okay. Well, you've kind of answered the next question that was in my head. And yeah, um, diversifying yourself outside of music and obviously touring full time while that seems to be everyone's dream and it looks like the most fun you can have. I was going to ask, you know, is that something sustainable? Is that something you can do for years and years? Uh, I mean, it, it depends how you, how you paint it really. Like, uh, 
it's a lot of fun uh, and you get a lot of great photographs and you build a personal connection with the band. So that's something obviously I enjoy. But it depends on the circumstances you're in. Uh, you are in, sorry. Like uh, if touring's your thing and you want to go see the world for free, then uh, I mean, go for it. But for me, like I've always had the idea of, you know, I, I want to go see the world and I want to meet different people. I want to see different places. But at some stage, like me meeting someone and maybe having a family and all that sort of stuff has always been at the back of my head. Yep. So for me, uh, I could not picture being 30 and having that sort of setup and then flying around the world for 50 days on end. I, I could not picture that. I don't think it's sustainable. I don't think the lifestyle is very sustainable either. I, it's, it's very tiring on, on, on your body. But uh, there's people that obviously do it. I mean, obviously the go-to man, Adam Elmakais, he does it. But then again, that guy doesn't own a house. Uh, I don't from 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 what I from what I know doesn't have a girlfriend or any, or any of that. So there's no liabilities at home, so to speak. So if you have no liabilities at home and touring is what is you know what you want to do, then for sure it's it's sustainable. But if you have liabilities at home, say you have like kids, a girlfriend or a fiance or a wife, whatever, uh, then you need to think other about other options. And you know touring's just not it. But you know what, tour while you can, see the world for free, yeah. make make some connections. I, I don't mind uh, staying settled in Perth or wherever I end up relocating and then flying out uh, international, you know, for one week or just to do, you know, project work if, if work ever takes me in that direction. I wouldn't mind doing that every now okay. and then. Yep. But continuous continuous touring, uh, yeah, I can't see that being a thing much uh, much too far down the track past, you know. I'm 23 now. I don't want to be touring, you know, when I'm 27, 28. So uh, we'll see where it goes. Okay, cool. So what you're saying is it's basically apart from the working situation, apart from whatever money or benefits or uh, career benefits that you get from it, it's a very personal thing to be able to tour for that long. Is that what you mean? Oh, I think so, 100%. Like there's, uh, I, I mean, you see it You see it with some artists that struggle, you know, struggle to be away from home as well. Yep. I mean, obviously they have no option because music touring is going to be their life. That's what they're aiming for. That's yeah. their goal. Uh, they want to. They, they want to make records. They they want to make money, and they they need a tour to do that. Uh, whereas with me, success or with any photographer, a success and you know having some fi- financial gain in the art that we create doesn't necessarily need to be away from home all the time. Sure. So uh, yeah, I, I, you know it's all about being comfortable, and I think I just don't think touring is very sustainable in uh, in being a comfortable person. Okay. But um, that, that's for me. Uh, that's not for me to decide for other people. But that's how I just feel about it. So um. <laughs> switching gears a little bit, I want to come back to the touring thing a little bit later. But switching gears a little bit, we've already talked a little about a little bit about um, the specialized versus generalized debate. You mentioned that you're sort of just dabbling in a little bit of video. Where do you weigh in on that? Like, um, yeah, are you one of those people who will sort of take on a bunch of different jobs, or do you like to have your main focus and your own niche and work on that? Look, uh, I'm totally about having your own niche. I think it's important to have your own focus. And I was actually going to touch base on this when you when you do that question about you know if you had five hundred dollars, a camera lens, and a body, and all that sort of shit. Oh, okay, I wasn't um, going to ask that, but I'll ask it later now. Oh, okay. Well, uh, well, whatever. But um, I think I think having a niche is important. You know, like uh, you can't you can't really shotgun blast an approach to all sorts of markets on the field. So that, that's to say, like. If if you're a music photographer and you want to do commercial, you can't do weddings, head, landscapes, fine art, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and just try and grab everything. You know, yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> it's just better to focus on one thing and to, to build a solid portfolio. I mean, if you go to a client and you want to get, uh, say, your client is um, say bands, for example. Yeah. So your your client is managers, bands, labels, whatever. Uh, you need a strong portfolio and to grab a strong portfolio of just bands is, you know, the things they want, maybe just solo portraits and bands. Mm-hmm. To build a strong portfolio of, say, 20 images takes a long time. It does. But if you start shotgunning things, shotgun blasting things, so you start shooting um, headshots, weddings, uh, fine art, landscapes, you're taking a whole lot of time. You're burning a whole lot of time to create a solid portfolio. Okay, yeah. And, and you know... Uh, if you don't have a niche, then you have that struggle. So for me, I feel like it's just better to uh, just target one thing or two things and just uh, stick at it. You have to also think about the clientele you're targeting because when they when they're thinking, okay, I need a I need some band promos, um, they're not going to go to a corporate photographer yeah. 
and get banned uh, and get banned photos. They're going to probably look at a portrait or a music photographer, and you know, you type you type in music photographer into Google, you're going to find probably more music photographers than corporate photographers. So I think it's important to create a niche, um, and you know, just do it like that. I think I, I think that's hundred percent the way to go. Just focus on one thing. Um, in regards to photo and video, uh, I, I know photographers and videographers that do both. Yep. I, I personally just like photos. Uh, videos, look, I've only just touched base on video just for this one time. So videos is too time consuming for my liking. Uh, I'm getting sustainable work, I think, just a photo. So I'm just going to hold on that. And, you know, if I did video, I would have my mate shredding me. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I'm just going to stick to photos because that's what I know and love. And, you know, I, I think it's definitely possible just to be you know just have your hands full with it so um totally yeah i would i would tend to agree with that i mean from a marketing perspective they say if everyone is your client then no one is your client exactly whereas if you my kind of main thing has been band promos i've not done anywhere near what the sort of work that you've done but i've tried to focus on band promos in a way that i want to be the band promo guy in melbourne definitely and, and i've yeah, I've got friends who are successfully doing weddings and doing a bunch of other stuff um, because, hey, you got to hustle. you got to make ends meet and and, um, and work where you can. But um, for me, it's not – I don't rely on this as my sole income. I work another job, so I've tried to be the, the promo guy. Anyway. Yeah, and I, I, I agree. And you know what? I think like we were saying before, like I think it's good. You know, you're staying focused on one thing and, you know, you're using your time wisely and, you know, uh, I think if you can be comfortable in doing one thing that you want to photograph and, you know, that you love, I have no doubt in mind you can find success in that. And, you know, for, for me, I don't think, like, you have a second job and whatnot, and I'm, I'm the same, oh, well, same, but it's still photographic. Like, by no means does it not mean shoot anything else or do any other jobs. Yeah. You know, like, I sometimes shoot socials at, uh, you know, nightclubs, and I document stills at events and cou- ca- um, council meetings for local government. Sure. You know, just to roll over and pay the bills. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, you won't find that on me, you know, anywhere. So, you Google my name, you get Max, music photographer, total Desmond, Perth, WA. So, <laughs> you, you just market yourself online to what you want to be, but you can still do those other jobs. Just make sure people know you for who you are. So, so for, for what you, for what you want to do. So, you know, you go meet people, you go meet managers, and you want to be a music photographer, but secretly... Uh, you're shooting for a nightclub just to roll in money. You know, you shake the hand, you shake the hand, buy them a beer, and go, "Hey, look, <clears throat> my name's PJ. I take promos. Um, I'm a music photographer. Boom, sold. That's who you are. And you can do everything else on the side. Just don't market yourself as anything else. You know? Yeah, I really like that. So yeah, take take on the jobs, do what you like, but professionally, you only show one type of photo. Is that what you're saying? Oh, exactly, exactly. So and you have to you have to find, show value in your work. So you know, present something new. Obviously to them if you were going to market yourself in one thing, um, but for sure. Okay, excellent. All right, let's move along. So back to the touring aspect of your business, from the photos that you take, it looks like a pretty glamorous rock and roll sort of lifestyle, but I'm assuming it's not always that way or at least it didn't always used to be that way. How did you learn to be a touring photographer and like what challenges were there to get to a national and international level? Uh, cool. So... Uh well, this this might be a bit of a long one. So for me, it's always I've always wanted to tour and you know have access to shoot exclusive photos because I like creating, uh, and without sounding like a, a loser, like I just like creating different photographs that are separated from the rest. And yeah. to be fair, if you're going to have those opportunities, uh, you have to you have to get access, or you have to be on tour with a band, you have to be comfortable with the artist. Uh, for me, like uh, it's kind of strange calling myself a music photographer, but I hate shooting live shows it's the it's the one thing i hate really, I really yeah I, I hate i hate shooting live shots um you know i like i I'm a, i count myself i consider myself a portrait photographer mm-hmm. i like i like photographing people it's my favorite thing in the world I, I i photograph musicians because i love musicians i want i want to be the people that i photograph and you fall in love with your subjects and you know it's quite common uh, i fall in love with the people that i want to photograph so if i wasn't a photographer i would try and be a musician so for me that this is why i shoot musicians and i tour uh, I tour to get access to shoot portraits. Uh, uh, you know, shooting live shows just comes hand in hand with the work that I do. Yep. So, uh, so for me, to jump on tour was something I really wanted to do because I wanted those exclusive photos and I wanted to grab portraits of the people that I tour with. Yeah. So um, it, it's a very long road how, how this all came about. You know, there's, there's a music photographer I used to fall in love with called uh, Jess Bomong. He, he's, he's actually he's from Canada. 
and his work is fantastic. He used to tour with uh, City in Color, Alexis on Fire, all okay. that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. He had all the behind the scenes stuff, and you know, it was very cool. He shot some blogs. Uh, he put all these photos on blogs and stuff. It's it was all really cool. And I was like, okay, I I, I really want to do that. Anyway, so uh, you know what? I'm going to go on a bit of a tangent here. I'm go, just going to go for it, this. Man. Yeah. Run with okay. It. So uh, I was dating this girl uh, five, six, six years, uh, five years ago, and like, uh, you know, it was, it was hor- horrible. Uh, but I dated her, <laughs> but she was the best thing ever because she went out, she went out clubbing uh, one night in Fremantle, taking a whole bunch of drugs, and she met this girl, and you know, she was bragging a little bit, probably talking more crap about me than I usually do, and right. she was like, oh, you know, uh, my boyfriend's a music photographer, rah rah rah. And this lady was like, oh, that, that's, that's really cool, you know, whatever, rah, rah, rah. Anyway, a week later, I get this phone call. And it's this lady my girlfriend at the time had been talking to. Yeah, and, she, yeah. and she calls me and she goes, hey, look, um, uh, one of our photographers have bailed. Uh, I, hear, I hear you shoot music. Would you be interested in coming in tonight and shooting, you're shooting some bands? Yeah, yeah. And my mind was blown because I wanted to be a music photographer, but I'd never actually photographed a band before. And not no portraits, no live work. I didn't know the process. I just wanted to be a music photographer. And I said yes straight away. It was the best day of my life. It was four o'clock in the afternoon. Packed my gear up, went straight to the venue. And it, it was so strange because when I rocked up to the venue, I got given uh, a triple A pass, which yeah. is like uh, access all areas. So for already my mind is blown. Like I'm like, wow, I've got one of these. But what I did not know, it was, uh, it was uh, a, uh, an event called Soundwave Counter Revolution which was, uh, it's like a mini Soundwave, Soundwave festival. Okay. And it had like bands like All Time Low, Yellow Card, Panic at the Disco, wow. uh, Story of the Year. And I'd just been thrown in the deep end. Like my first ever photo gig was, was this. And so my mind is blowing and I'm just thinking, holy shit, there's so many bands, like big bands here that I can work with right now and create these stills and photographs that I've, be, I've always been dreaming of creating. Uh, this is going to be absolutely insane. So what I did was I did exactly that. I pushed the boundaries more than you should or you should do as a photographer backstage, but you're young and stupid. Uh, and I just went around backstage shooting all these crazy photos, doing stupid stuff, shit I would not dare to do now because I know I know how it works. But but I did it, didn't get in trouble, uh, so to speak. Um, and I ended up creating all these photographs. And then the next day, uh, sent the photos to the venue that wanted the photos, yep. and I ended up getting a job with them, which enabled me to uh, you know get a weekly. Uh, you know, income. Yeah, yeah. So I was shooting at this venue for three days a week and I, I quit my bar work because I was working at a bar at the time to roll in money. I quit my bar work and I was taking photos three times a week, being able to pay rent, pay for food, et cetera, et cetera, uh, just the photos. And then whilst I was doing that, because the venue I was shooting at was a live music venue as well, um, I was able to meet managers, bands and whatever and, you know, build relationships. Sure. So at this time I'm shooting local bands, trying to build a portfolio, rah, rah, rah. And I'm, I'm wanting to do bigger and better things, you know. I'm punishing the, uh, the artist managers at Unified to get, let me do f- free photo shoots with their bands when they yeah. come to Perth, all that sort of stuff, just killing them. Uh, and I'm sorry to Nick Yates, that guy, I, I reckon I sent a thousand emails to that guy in the year of 2012. Like, I'm sorry, bro. Uh, and, but um, <laughs> I'm shooting all these bands and then I'm like, okay, so, so what I want to do, like I've, I feel like I've got a strong portfolio. I've, I've been shooting some pretty cool national bands, you know, like – one of the first national bands I shot was a band called Deez Nuts. And, you know, yeah, I, thought that was, I, th- I thought that was pretty cool when I first like, started shooting. And the, the nice guys, I thought that was pretty cool. But I wanted to do something uh, a bit different. I always wanted to have my photos featured in a magazine or something. And to see, to see your work in print is something entirely different. To see your work recognized, uh, it, it sounds, very, um, it sounds very, very egocentric, but everyone likes their work to be seen. So I wanted to see my work in a magazine. Yeah, so I started. Cool. I, yeah, so I started sending emails around to like uh, magazines. It was like Blunt Magazine, Hysteria Magazine, blah, 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 blah. And um, Standard didn't get a response, you know, whatever. Who cares? Whatever. Anyway, so I didn't get any responses. That was a bummer. So I tried sh- started shooting emails to international uh, magazines. They, I, they didn't have a bite for what I was sending them. Um, the bands that I was shooting, they obviously didn't get two shits for. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Whatever. So, uh, you know, I just went along shooting. At this point, like I'd started building uh, a good rap it with some of like the uh, national touring bands. I just started doing some work with uh, the Amity Affliction at the time. Yeah, uh, I'd befriended the drummer Ryan on Facebook, and we'd, we'd been talking a little bit. Um, 
Ryan's the nice guy in the band, so to speak, very open to creatives, loves talking with them, rah, rah, rah. Okay, excellent. So when, so when he was in Perth, uh, he was in Perth for Groove in the Moon a couple of years ago, uh, I said to him, hey, dude, would you, uh, hey, dude, <laughs> uh, I was like, hey, dude, would you like to, uh, would you like me to uh, take a photograph? I'd like to take your portrait one time. And, you know, he was down for it, which, you know, I was, to be honest, I was quite shocked. So I took, him into, I took him into my studio in Perth, took some photos of him. You know, I was like, fuck yeah, this is going to be cool. This is going to be on my website. You know, Ryan from the Amity Affliction, this will look cool, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. Anyway, within six hours after taking the photos, as you do, the photos are already on Facebook and, you know, the website, whatever. And a bunch of his f- friends or followers or whatever started following me on, on social media. Mm-hmm. And there was this one girl. And now she's going to kill me for saying this. There's this one girl I clicked on her profile because she had the big boobs happening and all this sort of stuff. Right. I clicked on her profile and her name was Martina. And she, it turns out she was actually one of the writers at Hysteria Magazine. So I hit her up and I was like, okay, this will be cool, you know, whatever. Hit her up on, you know, uh, Instagram, started talking. And then, uh, you know, hustled to get some, you know, feature work um, at the magazine. And, you know, yeah, she you was, she, she, yeah, I did, man. I did. And, uh, you know what? It was really cool. Like I started, like I started talking to her more, and we started making these ideas happen. She she really dug the work that I was presenting, and you know, uh, she, she's a very honest person. So like I, I would always go to her to critique my work and whatnot. And then all these all, all these jobs started coming in, like these photo shoots. You know, uh, hey, we need you to do like a feature for this band coming to Perth. It's called Get in the Van. Can you do a photo shoot with them? And uh, you know, in the back of the van, mm-hmm. hanging out, and then we'll put in the feature. And I was getting stoked because my photos were being featured and uh, uh, it was cool, man. So I started doing that and then I started having bigger goals. I wanted to take cover shots. I was like, what do I need to do to be a cover shot photographer? Now at this point, I'm about a year or two away from that ever happening. Yep. Yep. So I'm still shooting, rah, 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 rah. And then I, I, wanted, I, I still wanted to do touring. I'd done a couple of local band, to, like a local, uh, local bands touring around the, oh my God, tongue tied, fuck. <laughs> uh, I started touring with local bands around the country. Had done that a few times. I think at that point I'd done like two, maybe three Amity or Enhanced Weight tours, but nothing, nothing absolutely massive. Hey, anyway, they're, they're still pretty good local tours, man. Oh, no, 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 no. They're great. They're great. But I like, you know, like I'm, they're, they're fantastic bands and they are, they are the bomb. But uh, I, I but you're addicted at this point. You're ready yeah, for you're the next addicted. level. You're addicted, man. You want to. Sure. You want to. You want. You always want something bigger and better. I mean, I've, I'm talking about like five seconds of summer, like not too long ago. Yeah. Like I'm not saying they're better, but they're definitely bigger. Um, so, you know, I, I just wanted to approach all these big tours. So, uh, two years ago, uh, Bring Me the Horizon uh, announced a uh, uh, national tour around Australia, mm-hmm. and I thought, wow, that would be huge. Um, that, that would be really cool to jump on board, I think. Uh, and there was another American band called Mice and Men that I wasn't too familiar with and then a couple of other bands, uh, a Japanese band called Crossfaith. Um, so I was like, okay, cool. I want to go on this tour. How do I make it happen? So I emailed their manager, uh, Matt, who I'd been emailing for a long time. He couldn't make it happen because, you know, you can't just jump on tour with a band that you don't necessarily know. Yeah. So, you know, whatever. Uh, couldn't make that happen. But then I hit up Hysteria Magazine with this, you know, proposal. And I said to them, how would you feel uh, if we created a tour diary? Uh, I created a tour diary of this tour. We document every single day of the diary and you put it in the magazine. I mean, I think people would want to see that. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. So I proposed to them this pretty incentive idea. And you know what? I put myself in the red zone. I said, you know what? Look, I'll fund this. I'll fund this myself. Um, but you get me the access. And we did exactly that. Um, around the time, I'd also won that uh, Qantas competition I was telling oh, yeah. you about. And that gave me five thousand dollars worth of free flights and hotels. So boom. excellent timing. Yeah, smack that in. Um, so it was a cost. You know, let's just say it didn't cost me anything because it didn't. Yeah. Technically, uh, and I did the tour. But on that tour, you developed uh, friendships and relationships with managers and different bands. Bands I thought I would have no idea working with. Um, and you know, I, I never thought that the whole tour was pretty much for me just to jump on board with Bring Me the Horizon and, and create a relationship with them. But you end up, I ended up creating relationships with uh, the two support bands as well of Mice and Men and um, Crossfade. Crossfade. Yep. And, you know, just as things happened later down the track, I, that, that presented more opportunities. So uh, for me, for me to, to get touring and to do the international tours and the big tours, you really have to put yourself out there. You have to put yourself in the red zone. I mean, it came from shooting, shooting local shows to hustling some girl with blonde hair uh, that worked for Hysteria Magazine. God bless you, Martina. You're an absolute <laughs> legend. Um, to uh, shooting for uh, Joey, the editor at Hysteria Magazine. 
to being jump to, to jumping on boards to these big tours and funding yourself. I mean, the, the magazine could get me access, but the budget was at the time wasn't big enough to throw in tour. Yeah, yeah. So you you make the opportunities your own. So I did that, and then now it's now it's totally interesting because I've put myself out there and I put myself in the zone. Uh, in the zone, I put myself out there. I put myself in the red zone. Uh, I think managers of those bands and you know the, uh, the writers and the editors at the magazines respect that, and they see that as a good investment in someone who wants to make something of themselves. So uh, it, it created a lot of opportunities. Yeah. And now, uh, like I've, I've got to see the world a lot to do thanks to you know Bring Me the Horizon and Cross Faith who have taken me to, out to the UK and Japan and whatnot just based on that tour alone. So, And you know what? You do those tours. You do those tours and you meet other bands. You do those tours, it gets recognized from other artists and they take you out on more tours. And it's, it, it's literally, it, it is a rolling stone. It is. It's a snowball. Yeah. So you do these bigger tours and you're always getting more work. So, I mean, at the same time, you have to present good work. I mean, if you don't have a good body of work, you're, you're never going to get you're never going to get tours, of course. but you have to put yourself out there to make those tours begin. So, you know, you've got to throw yourself in the red zone, you know, you put, put some money out there and then hopefully you see a return. So jump off a cliff and learn how to fly on the way down. Uh, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, I love just, it, buy, man. just buy a good set of wings. Thank yeah. you so much for sharing that. I really appreciate it. Did you give your girlfriend a big bunch of flowers and a kiss? Uh, you know what? We broke up probably a week after I had that oh job. Oh, my God. Yeah, she was horrible, man. And you know what? It was oh, it was rough, man. No, just kidding. Uh, yeah, so we broke up like probably a week after I got that job. But it was probably the easiest breakup ever purely because I was having such a high life off those photos that from that job. All so right, okay. I, was, I was waving my head. Um, you know, thinking about myself, about, you know, how cool of an opportunity that was. Nice. So I didn't really care. So. <laughs> yeah, I think you came off better there. Yeah, I think so. But, you know, whatever. So you mentioned before Hysteria, at least at the time, didn't have the budget to send you overseas or send you around the country or whatever. And I'm assuming that most of the bands aren't going to put that sort of investment into someone, especially if they're just meeting them. From a business perspective, how how is it possible to survive on the road if you didn't have the Qantas money under your belt? Like, what other forms of revenue or income can you generate on the road? Well, the thing is, like, well, it's it's like with any other. I think I'm not going to speak on behalf of bands because I don't think it. Yeah, I, well, I think it's the case, but I'm not too sure. Yep. Um, but it comes out of their own pocket. I mean, local bands tour the country and they're losing money straight from the get go. Um, you know, they pay for flights. They they rent equipment, whatever. Mm-hmm. They're they're, lo- they're losing money, and they're selling three tickets to a show, maybe a T-shirt to someone's grandma at the show. They're, they're losing money, but they're, yeah. they're touring because they they want to create opportunities for people to hear their, their music and you know to sell themselves. Uh, for me, that first tour wasn't you know I was putting myself in the red zone. I wasn't making money, but at the same time, back home I was shooting at a nightclub three times a week, saving some money, putting it aside. So my job at home was what was funding that tour. So uh, so my job at home was what was surviving me on tour. So had I not, you know, struck lucky and had that Qantas competition, um, you know, I would have, I would have found other ways to have, pres- you know, funded that tour. I would have, and it's a lot of money, like maybe like nine hundred to seventeen hundred bucks for an Australian tour. Yeah, it's a lot of money, but I, I mean, that's that's, I mean, it's not a whole lot of work to get that money. To you know, you work at a bar, you you take a part time job or you know, full time job, or whatever, to get that money, or you work in a call center or retail, whatever. You raise that money to get those opportunities. And you know what? Even even if you get nothing out of it, like I, I'm always very smart about the tours that I pick and choose. I always I always plan tours that I think that will benefit me. But you know, even if you just do tours that don't benefit you, and they're just like you know, they they you know they're a recognized they're a recognized band, whatever. You, you're literally paying for a holiday. It's good fun to be on tour, you know, yeah, especially absolutely. your first time. So there's really no sacrifice there. Um, and you know, that's not to say that that Bring Me the Horizon tour wasn't the first tour that I ever funded. I mean, I toured. I think the first Amity tour, uh, yeah, the first Amity tour I funded just from cash that I made at the nightclub. And then after that, it gets funded through other avenues, either through the magazine, the label, whatever. So you put yourself out there and you put yourself in the red zone. So for me, I just didn't roll the dice and I won a competition. I got lucky and I, I won some flights, you know. Um, you, you can make a real investment with the work that you have back at home. You just have to put it into the work that you want to do. And then hopefully if you present good work and, you know, you make use of the money that you spent on that tour and you know, you're know you on that tour and you take it as a trial run, then you, you'll see a return where you know the bands and labels will invite you back on tour and they will fund the flights, they will fund your hotels yep. and they'll pay you per show. And then when you're getting paid per show after the tour, they'll also give you money during the day to make sure you can eat. So 
Uh, for, for most international bands and national bands as well, you get a thing called PDs, which is per diems. Yep, yep. yep, correct. And they'll give you, uh, like, say, 20 bucks a day just to, just to uh, pay for food to get by. And then they'll give you uh, maybe like 200 or 220 bucks a week just for, you know, taxis, food or whatever, what other expenses. Sure, sure. So it gets you by on tour until yeah, yeah. you get home and you can send that invoice and get paid. So you can survive on tour if you're at that level. But initially, uh, if you're not at that level, then you just get by by working a job, slaving away at home and, you know, making an investment for your work because that's what it's about. Yeah, and yeah. everyone does it and there's no secret about it. But, you know, you know, like the whole industry as well, like as a music photographer, um, I'm not sure how people sell it. Like you can, you can create money out of touring, but there's only it's, – it's the top 1% that do that and, and then the top 1% that do make money make no money at all, so to speak. Like it's very little. You don't, you don't make a huge – ton of money you do it because you love it um and i mean i, I think music photography uh t- sorry to go on a tangent uh, i think music photography is not even about like to, to, to monetize music photography is not even about taking photographs of musicians anymore i mean you have to monetize in other ways so not not to speak on behalf of elma kais but you know as you can see like you know you sell t-shirts with cats or faces on it or you sell um lens bracelets very smart moves. I'll do the same if I could push that many sales. But it's no longer about music photography to make to make it profitable. You have to find other avenues of finding success in it. Uh, if music photography is something you wholeheartedly want to do and you aspire to do nothing else, so uh, props to him. But uh, you, you know, it's just an interesting industry. If you're heading into music photography to, to make money on it, you're not going to make any money out of it. You just do it because you love it, and then hope that you can shoot, you know, do something else on the side or you can do music full time, but you have to find other avenues to monetize it. So I guess Adam's a perfect example. You know, he has all this merchandise happening, and you know what? Props to him because he's absolutely killing it. So um, well, that's yeah. that's something about this sort of job that fascinates me, which is the passive income side of things. So what I when I say passive income, I mean income that you can generate without trading your hours for time, um, like the merch or like I, I remember seeing a while ago you had some a limited run of prints with Bring Me that you got them to sign? Is that that's right? That's correct. That, that's correct. So, um, see, but, but that's, all very, that's all very lucky. So what happened was uh, I ended up like with the Amity tours and the Bring Me tours, I ended up doing like a limited run of prints. And you know what? Yeah, I sold those prints because uh, at the time I was, still, I was still shooting at nightclubs and making money. But, I, you know, I thought I'd sell prints just, you know, for the hell of it. And I, I uh, put up a – I'd never printed before, and I put up this uh, post saying, "Look, I'm selling one print of this, 24 by 40 inches." It was like an auction, and it sent, it was a picture of Dallas Green actually, and it sold for six hundred dollars. And wow. I was like, "Whoa, there's money in this." And then I did one the next day of, of another photo. It auctioned off for four hundred fifty dollars. I was like, "Okay, this is mental. Like, this is this is a week's worth of touring money right here. Like, so this is a whole tour. Like, your whole tour's worth of invoices." I was like, "This is insane." So I started trying to monetize it by doing like, you know, 20 photos at like $200 each. And yeah, they sold. So, uh, I, I, yeah, I started doing prints. Uh, I started doing prints and uh, it, it worked. But with the Bring Me the Horizon thing, um, I'm not going to go into too much detail because I don't think it's my call to, to talk about it. That's fine. But, but with the Bring Me the Horizon thing, uh, essentially uh, a Jordan who was in the band, uh, who's in the band um, approached me and just said, hey, uh, would you be interested in, in um, using some of your photographs? We, we're creating uh, a merchandise company called Horizon Supply Co. Um, we, we think it would be really cool to do like uh, a limited run of prints. So we could do 500 prints, uh, five different photos. So uh, 100 prints of each different photo, we'll sign it and then we'll you know, give it away to the fans. How would you feel about that? I said, hey, that would be really cool. Um, you know, I, I love the guys and you know, they've, done, they've done good by me. So I was like, you know, just have the photos. But, um, you know, as luck would have it, um, Horizon Supply ended up getting back to me and give, uh, paying me a licensing fee just to use the photos. So, I mean, that's not something you can necessarily just approach and make happen. That's just by pure luck that someone's hit you up and said, hey, man, uh, we want to use your photos. So I can't really plan that sort of stuff. Yeah. But I think there's definitely avenues where you can monetize the music game, um, like selling prints. But things like that, the whole Bring Me the Horizon thing, that's just by someone just approaching me and I, that's something you just can't really read. So, Yeah, uh, I, just, I just am super fascinated with that because even when, and I'm not saying they don't have the budget, but even when a band, let's say with a following, doesn't have a budget to 
pay you the sort of money that they want to or you you feel like you deserve. I find it interesting that using their following or using their following to grow your following, there can be a way to generate revenue. I mean, and and that's the whole thing. Like I I owe a lot to uh, say bring me and you know the Amity Fiction, the My Cement or whatever because. I wouldn't have pushed those print sales by myself had it, had it not been for their following. So right. for me, like, I mean, touring has never really been about making money. It's always been being able to create. And it sounds pretty cliche and, you know, you hear it all the time. But, like, for me, I just want to create pretty photographs. I find huge satisfaction in taking a photo of uh, something that's pretty or done in, in, done in a correct way. And what better way to do something like that than with someone who's recognized or familiar in the public eye? Where's your, where's your work can get recognized? So I, I always enjoy doing it with bands like that because my work gets recognized because people want to see who they are. And if you can present uh, those sort of types of people in good light and you know with quality work, then it does really well for you. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, I was, so I was getting a good, uh, a good follow account, so to speak, from that. And in, in, that, you know, in those circumstances, I was able to uh, sell prints. So you know, a licensing fee with or without, you know, I'm more than happy to provide to that band because, um, I mean, they've done so much for me to begin with. So. For me, like I'm not really too fussed about making uh, coin off the off their end. I, I'll make coin on my end, but if they can provide, you know, the avenue for me to, to do that, aka with their following base, fan base, then I'm more than happy. So, uh, you know, do my own work. <laughs> yeah, I love it, man. And I just want to say how appreciative I am of what you were saying before. I know it's given me a new perspective in just like the last 10 minutes and I'm sure a lot of people listening to this are going to have their mind blown in treating yourself as an artist touring the way that you would tour a band or a music artist so you take a loss you take a few chances you invest some of your own money in order to close the circle as they say so like in the same way that a band would get a record deal and tour to pay it off every record deal they get after that from touring, they get bigger and they can pay it off quicker and quicker. So I think that's super interesting that that's the way that you think about it and you've definitely changed my perspective. I mean, I think it's definitely the way to go. Like, uh, like, uh, yeah, well, it, well, it is. I, you, think of, you think of ways to get on tour and I can't really think of any other ways than that. I mean, you can try and hustle managers and stuff to get on tour without paying it for yourself, but I don't really know the trends of that happening. I'm just, I'm just explaining the way that I know how. Yeah. Um, and there's, I don't think there's really any secrets about that. I think everyone knows it. They just hope for something different. But you know what? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Just explore that route. And if you, if you, if touring something you want to do and make the investment, put some money into it, maybe you will have to keep. You know, I, I know people that have done five, six, seven, eight tours just out of their back pocket. That that's a hundred percent fine. Uh, maybe uh, at that point you just keep funding tours, but maybe start putting expenses towards bigger bands and providing opportunities. Um, and providing uh, good plans of attack to managers to say, hey, look, um, I'll be willing to fund this tour myself. I just want to document this band and then try and make that happen. So sometimes it's not even about funding the money and jumping on those tours. It's being strategic with who you tour with and who's going to give you the return. So sure. yeah, well, touring, I mean- simply touring all the time does not mean you're going to get a, a you know, return. You might get a return from that band. Like if you keep touring with a small local act, I mean, that band's going to be loyal to you. But I mean, you're probably going to put more money into, say, a band like that and get very little back as opposed to putting a lot of money into an international act who is probably going to take you back if you put a good investment and provide good content. So it's all about being smart about what sort of, what sort of tours you want to invest in and then, and then trying to make those tours happen. Yeah, well, I guess in that regard, the ROI or like return on investment comes from what you do on those tours and the contacts you meet and what can possibly come afterwards. Would you say that's correct? Uh, yeah, 100%. Okay, cool, man. Well, yeah, like the touring thing, like personally, it's not my sort of deal. That's not where I aspire to be. But I just find that new perspective super interesting. I've never thought of it like that. I mean, I think you're like me. Like if, if, if you love taking promo photos, like I'm not sure if you feel the same way about music photos. But for me, like as a promo photographer, and that, that's what you were saying before, you like taking portraits of bands and you want to be that guy. Yeah. Um, that's, a, you know, that, that's the thing. Like I, I want to I, I be that person. I want to I wanna stay settled down as well. I'm just trying to take a different avenue to try and get some different photographs and to, to build clientele so I can take promo photos of different and bigger and better bands because that's how I'm thinking that's how I'm going to get those opportunities. But I agree. I, I don't want to be touring. I want to stay settled. But, I mean, you just take what you can get. Yeah. Uh, so uh, are, are you a fan of, like, taking live photos? or Which, which do you prefer? Like, do you, do you get a kick out of both? Or? 
Band promos is my favorite thing. Um, that's always been my goal and that's been my main focus. Of course, I love taking live photos. I think I think you're pretty rare if you don't as a music photographer, but <laughs> you've got your own reasons and I completely respect that. But the reason that I love taking promos is because I feel I can do something that not everyone else can because every local show that I go to, there's honestly like 10 plus kids taking photos and a lot of the photos turn out the same anyway. So yeah. I, I like to find band promos as my point of difference and I like to think I can offer something different to everyone else because everyone wants to take the live photos and do the touring thing. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head, man. Like f- for me, that that's that's pretty much why I don't like live photos be- because like for me, I get a satisfaction out of positioning the band, uh, controlling the light. Mm-hmm. I have total control over the light over the way they're positioned. And then when I produce the result, I take the photograph, click, boom, edit the photo. I can sit back and go, hey, that's my photo. Um, uh, while also the show, we're very heavily much dictated by the lighting technician, Yeah. Uh, the size of the stage, uh, having instruments in our photos, which in my opinion, I fucking hate. <laughs> yeah, light stands like, and such. Kind of which, yeah, yeah, dude, for sure. And then like we also don't have control over the way they stand. Now, there's some bands that move around a lot, which look really cool when they move around. But I don't get I don't get I don't get a kick out of taking a photo where they look really cool because I didn't position them. I, it sounds very selfish and egotistical, but I want to look at a photo and go, "Hey, uh, you're that's, responsible for that." Yeah, that's mine. Okay. But, uh, but like in regards to like uh, you know everyone is a photographer and all that sort of stuff. Like I, I think I think photography is overly saturated. But like as a photographer, you and I, you know, we're also part of that problem. We're part of the oversaturation. Oh, of course. But, but what separates what, what what you want to do to separate yourself from the oversaturation is that should never having the market say the photography market oversaturated should never be an issue and I always I always kind of have a little bit of a laugh when that happens uh, because you know you have to build value for what you do and you know the type of work you create the experience you give and how you treat your clients separates you from the other photographers so no matter how oversaturated the market is you can always be your own so well, when I hear people say you know there's too many photographers and whatnot they don't really have a case in point unless they edited the same so I think you hit the nail on the head as well when you said uh, you know there's there's 10 photographers in the pen they all edit and shoot the same way and you know it all looks the same I agree that's disappointing but you know what such as yourself you want to do something completely different and you know you're building a totally different um, experience for your client and your bands you know it's not a problem for say people like yourself and other people in the industry that, you know, want to be a music photographer. Yeah. So I have absolutely no problem with a hundred million kids learning music photography. In fact, I enjoy it when people take it up because they appreciate it. And like, we're all in it together, you know, like I'm hoping that those people are going to come become my friends through this podcast and like the YouTube stuff I've been doing. I love when people get into it. I Yeah, dude, I, I, I completely agree. I wasn't, I wasn't dissing you at all. I was just more so building on a point you were making. But yeah, uh, yeah. No, no. I, I, I agree. I'm, I'm all for, I'm all for the 1,000 photographers. And to be honest, I'm very, I'm very new to the game myself. So uh, <laughs> I, I know you, you hear the old people, uh, the old people, you hear, you see, you see the old dudes in the photo pit with the 70 to 200 lenses and, you know, <laughs> they go, oh, look. Two buddies. Yeah. yeah. You know what? It was the funniest thing because I, I still rock one buddy. But um, I, I used to I used to jump in the photo pit with a Canon 7D, which was actually a pretty good camera at the time. It just came out, yeah. and a 17 to 55 kit lens. And I always liked shooting wide, so for me that was the that was the widest lens I could afford at that time. And I used to get the looks from the older dudes shooting for the radio stations, going, "What is this amateur doing?" And you know what? It's not about that. You just you just shoot what you want. I don't care if there's sure. a thousand. If, I don't care if there's a thousand people in the pit or two. Just shoot for yourself. Impress yourself and do something different and give a different experience and, you know, they'll separate you from the rest. So, you know, the people talking about there's an oversaturation of photographers, it's all bullshit and circle jerk crap, you know. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, you can only – your business is a reflection on yourself. So um, build it for your own and, you know, create a different experience and yeah. you're sought after. So Okay, I really like yeah, that. I agree so, with you. Yeah, everyone's got their own thing. You just got to find your own way to stand out, yeah? Oh, 100%. Yeah. Cool. And um, I've definitely seen – what you're talking about, like if you shoot in a photo pit with a couple of, you know, the older guys or the, the senior photographers or whatever, they've got all this gear and then you look at the photos afterwards and it's like you've got all this potential with all this gear and what you've created is something you could have done 20 years ago. Oh, you know what? And, you know, it's the case. And not to sound like a dick, but it's kind of funny. Um, the first one, one of the second or third times I started shooting uh, in a photo, actually the first time I shot in a photo pit, because yeah. uh, that, that gig I was telling you about, that Soundwave Canada Revolution thing, that was kind of just like in the nightclub, so that wasn't okay. really like a pit. But like, the first time I shot in a pit was at this, 
at this uh, Grinspoon show in Fremantle. And I was, on the, I was on this Esplanade and it was a photo pit. It was the first time I'd ever shot in a photo pit in front of a stage. Yep. And yeah, there were these guys. There were these guys with the 70 to 200s. They were shooting for radio stations. I heard them talking. They were looking at each other's photos from the support acts before. And I'm not really talking to them because I don't feel really comfortable talking to them. Sure. Uh, feeling kind of like, you know, whatever. And I'm just taking these photos. And then at the end of the Grinspoon, uh, after the first three songs after Grinspoon played, like we went to the side of the pit, and I was super ecstatic with how my photographs looked. Like I was like, I was like, oh, these these are these are pretty cool. Yeah. Anyway, and, and you hear these stories all the time, but I've I haven't crossed it since. And the guy's looking through my camera, and he's like, oh, why are you shooting in black and white? And I was I was like, oh, I just shoot in black and white so I can see the contrast between you know light and shadows. Like they'll come out in color on the computer. And he goes, oh, no, they won't. If you shoot in black and white. Uh, on on the camera, they'll stay in black and white when they're on the computer. I'm like, well, not if you shoot. Was not he if shooting you shoot. JK, JPEG? Yeah, I, I was like, yeah, not if you shoot raw. And he goes, what's that? And then I, I like, <laughs> I like, I, I don't, I, I'm not going to be that dick who's like, who's like, oh god, Desmond doesn't know what raw is. But this was the guy just giving me shit, you know, a set earlier for you know using a 17 to 55 kit lens, and this guy has probably tens of thousands of dollars worth of equipment, and he doesn't even know what raw is. I was just like, oh god, kill myself. So, you know, um, I just thought that was a funny experience. That's hilarious. But that's the first time I've, you know, ever really, I haven't seen, I, that was the first time I started taking photos and I've never really experienced anything like that since. But maybe that's just got to do with, I don't really give a fuck what everyone else is doing. I just keep to myself and shoot the gig and then walk away. So sure. but I was definitely at that point very much, uh, uh, I was very uh, familiar with my surroundings, trying to, you know, see what everyone else was doing. And then after that gig, like I just learned to be my own and do my own thing, shoot the photos that I take and, you know, uh, do what I can and just not to care what anyone else thinks because every photographer or every person who does their own soul trade as a business, whatever, has their, has their own opinion on how things should do and everyone's judgmental. It doesn't matter. Uh, you just got to focus on what's happening in your intent and, you know, do your own thing. So, yeah, I, I, I love it when I run across photographers like that because I love calling them out. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, they, they're, they're everywhere in all walks of life. So you have no, so, you know, you know, you have no at alls everywhere. You just have to do your own thing and, you know, do what you think works. So, yeah, yeah. Whatever. Maybe we need to enforce the hug rule before the th- start of the three songs where everyone just uh, hugs and oh, we, all, we all get along. Yeah, man, that would be really cool. Uh, but I feel like if there was a hug group, there would be a hug group full of uh, 70 to 200s, a hug group full of 18 to 55 kit lenses. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, you know, it'd be very uh, – I think they wouldn't want to hug me if I had a plastic lens on. So, right. The yeah. class system. Oh, yeah, 100% then, you know. So, uh, yeah. You, you could – Yeah. Yeah, I don't really need to go further on that. But okay, yeah. cool. We'll, <laughs> we'll leave it there. Um, I think you've already covered this. If you haven't, I'll cut it out. Um, if you have, I'll cut it out. Okay. How important is it to be a friend to your bands and clients before a photographer? Because I know you're. You mentioned you like to uh, call yourself a portrait photographer above anything else. Mm-hmm. How important is that to you to get the photos you need? Um. I think being a friend of the band is definitely part of the process. So sometimes it, it works both ways. So uh, you can't really pick and choose which way happen, which one happens first because sometimes uh, I'll put this into into perspective. So the last tour, which was the Vance Joy tour, yeah. Um, he James doesn't know me. He he doesn't know me at all. He was familiar with my work because he looked at it and then okayed me and then took me on tour. But he he doesn't know me for a bag of bricks. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, when I met him, I met him at the venue, um, met his manager, Rachel, and said hello to Rachel. Rachel introduced me to the band. She goes, hi, Max. These are nice guys. Rah, rah, rah. Hello, hello. Hi. Um, you know, I just introduced them. Say, hey, uh, I'm just going to take photos. Going to be a bit of a fly on the wall. Um, if I get in your way, let me know. Give me a signal. But I, I'm just going to take photos and we'll work from there. And, you know, took their photos during sound check. And then afterward, they went to the dressing room. Again, I was a fly on the wall. And then they approached me and started asking me questions. They asked me what I was about, what sort of bands I like touring with, and all that sort of stuff. And we just kept talking. And then you get comfortable around them, and then you talk, and then you build friendships. You know, that, that's yep. how it happened. But okay. then sometimes, sometimes you can actually build a friendship before the tour happens. For example, uh, with uh, that Bring Me the Horizon tour, I was only photographing Bring Me the Horizon and of my Men. I wasn't talking, I wasn't photographing Crossfaith. Um, and they were the main support, uh, so they were the opening band. But on that whole tour, I was developing friendships with them. I was talking to them because they were in the backstage area to hang out. Hello, hey, Max. And that was a really bad <laughs> Japanese accent. Um, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, you know, and then later on, they might invite you on tour and go, hey, do you want to come out on tour with us? Or uh, you're on a festival run. You're on a festival with like a particular band. 
and then you meet other bands that they hang out with and you talk to them, you bro out, whatever, Yeah. take photos and then, uh, so, you know, you bro out, you hang out with them and then they invite you to take photos. So, I, I mean, another one recently, which is kind of funny, was I was in the UK uh, in no- November, December last year doing some project work Yeah. and I went to a show, I went to a show and there was this guy like being a little motherfucking cheeky little bastard and uh, he was—he played. In a, I didn't know who he was, but he was being a cheeky bastard, and I was kind of being cheeky back. And then we ended up getting like—we we ended up getting along really well, despite having a, a few issues at the start. And then I ended up f- uh, finding out that he played in a band called um, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, Lower Than Atlantis. So, okay. and then uh, when Soundwave was coming around, he hit me up and he said, "Hey, um, we're playing Soundwave. Do you want to jump on tour with us?" So, uh, uh, well, I couldn't do Soundwave with them because I was on tour with another band at the time. But, I mean, th- that's how offers start. You start off as friends and then, you know, uh, you, you might get invited on tour. But I think, I, think, I, I think being a friend with them at some point is definitely important. If you're on tour and you can't make a connection with a band, I mean, you have issues. Uh, so you don't have issues, but you have an issue there. Whereas you're not going to get work with them again or your photos are just not going to be welcoming. I mean, yeah. I've, I've definitely been on a tour where I've not felt welcomed in the band room because of one particular person. So uh, you're very limited to your, to your photos. So, you know, you're on tour with bands that you get along with. You're, you're, in, this, you're in the personal space. You can have a picture of them uh, with their mum crying on their shoulder and you can take really personal photos. Right. But then if there's, if there's a band or a particular person that band you're just not connecting with and they're making a real issue of it and, and it's very hard to like, you don't feel comfortable in their space, then it's going to affect your photos. So it's all about... It's all about, and this has come. This comes with just making promo photos as well. If if you're meeting a band for the first time, you, you're not even going on tour with them. You're going to do a portrait of them. Yeah. Uh, you want to make a connection to the band, but sometimes it's not even about making a connection with them because sometimes you're not that type of character they might like. You're you're not their favorite person in the world. They, they wouldn't be friends with you outside of work. Right. But sometimes it's not a. It's not about making a connection. Sometimes it's just about not disconnecting. So as a photographer, it's important if you can't connect with someone at least do not disconnect and just grab those photos. But if you get to the point where you're disconnecting and uh, you know, you're feeling unwelcome, well, then your photos are going to uh, resonate that and you just you learn your lesson, you walk away from that band or that particular person and you try someone else. So, yeah, yeah okay. I think it's important to be friends with the band. Okay, so you're there to do a job. It's great to be friends and you'll get possibly better results. But if not, you've just got to get it done. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think so. And like, you know what? I, I think both come hand in hand. Like if you start photographing the band and, you know, they like the photographs, they're going to be friends with you anyway. Yeah, that's like, true. Uh, the, the last comment on the tour I, I went on, uh, one of the guys went up to me and said, you know what? It feels so weird because it just feels like you're a bro on the tour hanging out. That's so um, good. And, then, and that's cool. Like uh, I, I like that. And then sometimes you think, oh, wait, am I actually taking photos? I'm not even sure if I'm actually doing my job. But <laughs> you are. But yeah, yeah. You know, like I'm taking photos. It feels, but, it feels but too you, easy to be there like with them. Feel, yeah, you feel like the sixth member of the band and essentially you are because you're with them all the entire time. You don't have a guitar or a bass or a drum kit in your hand. You have a camera, yeah, but excellent. you're with them the entire time. You're, you're doing the same experiences and you know, you're someone new, you're someone ex- exciting. The, band's quite been, the band has probably been very comfortable with the band members they've been around before, uh, they've been touring with, the crew that they have. And the photographer is the new guy because the photographer is very disposable and having a new guy on tour is very exciting. So it's very easy to become fen- friends very quickly. Right. So right. Uh, if you're not friends with the band very quickly, well then yeah, it, it will affect your photos. Okay. okay. I'm expecting the larger the tour gets, there are a lot of people in the crew. If you're coming into a new crew, a new band or tour, are you always treated as an equal or does it take a bit of time to, to be on the same level you know, socially? You know what? I think it differs from band to band. And uh, for the most part, 95% of the bands that I've toured with, everyone's been so welcoming and cool. Okay. Uh, it's, really, it's really cool. Like, uh, I mean, some of the bands that I've, I've jumped on, like I jumped on a tour bus in America with uh, a band and the crew was so cool to me. And, you know, you kind of have to be really cool with someone new on your bus, man, because you're stuck on that bus for 50 days straight. If you don't get along with someone, it's going to be rough. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so some, some band and crew are really welcoming. But I've, I, I have been on a tour with a particular band, and the crew are so standoffish, and uh, it, it just makes it very it makes it very hard. But for, for every other single band that I've toured with, the crew's been so nice and polite. Like, they want to know who you are. They're excited to have someone new on the tour. You know, it's fun having something new. It's, yeah. like being in, it's like being in school. I'm not sure what school was like for you, but it's very rare to have a new kid in the class. Yeah, true. So when you have a new kid in the class, you want to suss him out. You want to know what he's about. You want to hang out with him. Is he, the new, is he going to be the new cool guy? Is he going to be the real big Desmond of the class? So they want to suss you out and, you know, you just do your best to try and get along with people. Um, 
But, you know, sometimes, like I said, sometimes you just have crew that are very standoffish. And maybe that has to do with the field of music that I work in or whatever. Okay, yeah. But, but yeah, sometimes you just have a crew that's just too cool for you, so to speak, and they have no time for you. Maybe because they're not pros, they're just bros of the band, you know? Sure. So uh, there's a thing a, a mate of mine mentioned that I'm not going to say his name, but he said in tour life you have two types of crews. You have bros and then you have pros. The guys that deserve to be on tour and then the guys who are on tour working with the band because they're just bros. The Johnny uh, Dramas, right? Yeah, for sure. Like, you know, sometimes the bros can be good at their work, but for the most part, they're on the tour because they're bros. Okay. And, you know, the bros don't really have time for the new guy to, you know, make time for him and talk to him and, you know, give him the time of day because they're too busy growing out with the rest of the band. And, you know, they would they don't want the new guy part of the, you know, they, they don't want to give time to him. So right. I've definitely been on tours where I've been on tours with the bros and, you know, it's been very hard. It takes me one or two, three tours for them to go, oh, you know what, this guy's all right or, you know, he's not too much of a dickhead or, you know, he is a dickhead, but, you know, he's an all right bloke. So um, I'll give him time. But I've, like I said, you, if you do stumble upon a tour like that and you, it's just full of bros and, you know, they're not being very too welcoming, well, and I think the best case scenario there is, uh, well, there is no best case scenario, you're fucked. So okay. you, just, you just get along with it. It's funny. <laughs> I always say the, in the hierarchy of whatever it is, bands, photographers, whatever, it's never the people at the top that are fighting each other. It's always the ones who are maybe, yeah, maybe a level below. So maybe if these guys are the bros and they're a little bit insecure about their place on the tour when a new guy comes in, maybe that's where the problem is. I notice on just on Facebook and stuff, like the low, the lower level music photographers in the scene and the lower level bands, they're always like arguing and talking shit about each other. And it's you know like what? the pros, they never do that. You know what? And it's entirely true. Like, uh, you know, I, I really do laugh when I see that because I do see it all the time. So a, a lot of the photographers are giving each other shit and they're creating all these like dramatic scenarios and all this sort of crap like, oh, so-and-so undercut me or some crap like this, rah, 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 or, fuck this dude because he's a fucking Desmond or something yeah. like that. I, I don't know, whatever. It's all, it's all relatively pathetic. And then same with the local bands as well. <clears throat> they're always fighting over like, oh, how did this band get main support or fuck this band, they got this tour, sure. you know, they're the worst, rah, rah, rah. Um, yeah, the, the, the bigger bands, they don't really care about that stuff because they don't have the time to worry about that. But it's also not necessary. There, there's no problem to worry. You know, there's, you know, at the end of the day, like, and I've said this to some of my closest friends as well that have brought up as issues. If someone undercuts you and they take your job, uh, is that really a reflection on yourself because they, they asked for a cheaper price or is it yeah. a reflection on their skill? If, if your work has value to it, people are, people are honestly willing to pay for it. So if someone took my job at History Magazine, they said, see you, Max, you're no longer head photographer, um, blah, blah is filling in, uh, you're Desmond, see you, buddy. I wouldn't take that personally. I would just say, okay, well, I, I need to improve my skills because I'm not up to par for a head photographer. Like, okay. my, my skills don't trade. So I never take it personally. I just say, okay, I need to re-equip my skills. So when I see photographers, uh, photographers, videographers, creatives, musicians, whatever, banter about the position on the board or banter about whatever they're doing or whatever, I always just say, look, you need to reflect on your skills and fine tune yourself because, I mean, it doesn't matter what any other photographer does. They, they actually cannot affect your business whatsoever. The only person that reflects you know, your business is yourself. So, yeah, I have no time for that and I don't think you would either. So, <laughs> Oh, no one should. It, it's fun to gossip. Don't get me wrong. I like, you know, it's fun to talk shit, you know. Talk shit between your close friends and whatever. Sure, but, yeah, if you yeah. create, but if you create something dramatic, you know, I like my own home in a way. I like to gossip. You know, gossiping is fun. But yeah. but there's never really any deep thought to it because you know it's just that it's just gossip. But people do like to create a problem of things, and it's just not the case. You know, it's it's not a big deal, and you know, photographers and videographers can no way affect your work. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think it's largely the insecurities of people that that causes that. And from my perspective, everything with your name on it online is reflecting on your brand. So why would you even bother? Why would you even sing to that? Oh, it's embarrassing. And like you know what, like. I, I mean, if if you follow me on social media or whatever, I can be very vocal, uh, in in a, in a, and I hope to think in a funny way. Like on my Instagram and all that sort of stuff, I'm very careful with what I say because it, it does reflect you. But on Facebook, like occasionally I'll say something pretty out there, but I'm always very careful in the way that I put it because uh, it, it could be interpreted a totally different way. But I'm I'm never problematic, and you know, I, I see I see things by other photographers where they post this huge spill about this other photographer doing something else and I just kind of sit there and laugh because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Uh, and you're right. I think they're just insecure in their own work and they want to create drama because they're bored, you know? 
at the same time, though, you I don't think you're ever disrespectful. And I can see that that stuff is consistent to your personal brand because chatting you to you for the last hour and 10 minutes, whatever it's been, I can see that you're you're very grounded, you're very confident in your work and you obviously have the portfolio to back it up. So I don't I don't see you being... I think the, the issue that we're talking about is when it's kind of like two-faced or someone's like trying to call out someone to look bad. I think what you're doing is sort of like making funny observations or whatever, but that's completely consistent to you and your brand. Does that sound fair? Yeah, I agree. I agree. So uh, I, I mean, like be yourself and say what you need to say, but be careful about what you think. Uh, you know, be careful what you do spill out, but you know, uh, I mean, ha- have a laugh and whatnot and, you know, talk shit on the internet, but don't, I mean, do it in a way that doesn't affect your business and make sure it's done in a humorous context, not so much that something that's serious because it does, it's very transparent when someone's actually having a real go at someone and they, they always look worse than who they're trying to make Yeah, fun. that's so true. I like it. So, uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's people out there like there's photographers like Zach Arias who, who, who have in his bio uh, on the guy who swears a lot and he will say, fuck this, fuck that. And you know what? I, I swear a lot, but you take it as the person as it is. But if you're a guy who's just like, oh, fuck this shit, I fucking hate this, rah, 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 then you come across as a complete Desmond because it looks like you're panicking and you're like, uh, uh, there's a way to be professional and swear. I know that sounds entirely ridiculous, yeah. but there's a way to keep your brand and your marketing as, as that guy who swears and still be professional on set. You know, it, it sounds strange, but it's achievable. But if you're just that sort of person who loses their shit on Facebook, then you have no place uh, to market yourself as a brand because you've got a long way to go. Yeah, especially if you're going to put it out there for the world permanently. I mean, it's good. You should see my Facebook feed on a Friday night. Like I have no problems with, with those sort of like, I'm sure they're lovely people, but like I have a lot of emotional people on my Facebook feed. So on Friday night, my hobby is going through my news feed and seeing who broke up with who, uh, <laughs> uh, who's having drunk. Like you see it in nightclubs, man. You go, you go to a nightclub and I'm, man, it's great. And I XO, sit there. XO. Um, oh, 100%. Like throw it at me. Like, oh, it's great. So I just go through my news feed on a Friday night. I'll, I'll go through it. And I end up just unfollowing them because like, I don't want to see that shit because it's kind of negative. Yeah, but at yeah. the same time, it's very humorous. And you never want to be the photographer who has the drama. Don't be that guy. Be, be discreet. Be quiet. And if you're going to say something on Facebook, make, you know, make sure it like, has some sort of input. Because you know, as a photographer, your name is your brand for yeah. the most part. You know, if, you have, uh, if you have a photography brand that's different to your name, Okay, then sure, maybe you could get away with it, maybe. But for the most part, every photographer is identified by their name. Yeah, that's so, true. So whatever you say on Facebook, like I guess it, I guess it's more weight on your shoulders, but it reflects your business. So, I mean, I mean, implement a little bit of humor into your business if you wish, but you make sure it doesn't go the other way, you know? Yeah, I think that's very valuable advice. Yeah, so. I mean, and you, have to, you also have to be careful not to not to go on here, but you know, you know, other managers and whatever, or you know, people you people you hire. Don't think for a second they're not going to look at your Facebook and see what you write because I know I know it's something I do and I know other managers they do this. When you approach a manager and uh, you email them, I, I know they look at your name on Facebook because they want to see what you look like. Okay, right. is this like yeah, is this yeah. like a seventeen year old kid or is this like a twenty three year old dude or is this a twenty eight year old guy who wants to be serious who wants to be on tour? And then they start scrolling for your statuses, man. And then next minute they see shit like you know, your girlfriend broke up with them so you want to kill someone or something like that. They see that sort of shit, they're not going to want you on tour. So you have to be, you have to be pretty spot on with what you post on social media. But I think that's pretty much just a given. I don't think that really needs to be said, does it? Yeah, well, that's so true. I've never thought about it like that. But come now that you mention it, whenever I do work with someone new or a new band or whatever, first thing I do is look them up. And it's not just about the number of friends or the number of likes on a page, you, you do go through and look at the interactions, like you say, to see how they act and how people react to them. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, just be careful about those shirtless selfies and stuff like that. Uh, that's apparently cringeworthy. Okay. I've done, so yeah, I, I got rid of those selfies. Okay, good, um, good advice. Yeah. Um, where are we at? Cool. Let's switch it up a little bit now mm. and get a little bit geeky. How big is the kit that you travel with? Uh... Yeah, it, it depends. So, uh, okay, it, it's fairly bulky, but like it, it, it's it's a reflection of the, the type of photos I want to take. So, I, I generally just tour with one camera body. Yeah. Uh, recently, I've actually acquired two. Yeah. Uh, but I, for the most part, I'm more than happy to tour with one camera body, and then I chuck on. I have a couple of lenses because I, I like shooting primes. Mm-hmm. It's just, you know, I just like shooting primes. It's your style. Uh, yeah, I just like shooting with one focal length because I know when I pick up that lens, I know what it's going to look like down the viewfinder. 
for right. me, it's not about the lens being superior, sharper than zoom lenses or whatever. It's more so I just I can pick up a lens and I know what it's going to look like. Um, so I shoot with prime lenses, which can be a bit of a struggle when taken on board. But yeah, I have this Pelican case, and it, in, in this Pelican case, which is this massive hard case for you that don't know who Pelican case is. Yeah. Um, it's a massive hard case, and inside that Pelican case, I have a, a pro photo light, which is a studio light. Mm-hmm. I have a camera body and two slots for um, a couple of uh, two prime lenses. And then I also have another case uh, that I also bring with me that has is just filled with lenses and whatever. And then I have a soft case that has my modifier and my light stand. So what I do is uh, I have quite a big touring setup, but it's quite compact. So I have a lot of bags. So I have maybe like four bags. I have my luggage bag. I have a Pelican case, I have another Pelican case, and then I have a soft bag. So yeah, it's quite a bit, but it's quite compact. And when you tour with a band and they have like a, when you tour with a band, it doesn't matter how much stuff you bring because usually it'll be covered. It'll uh, be in a trailer or something. Yeah. Or even when you fly international, like the band flies the whole, the whole gear across. So for me to have four items to have checked in is really not that big of a deal. Okay. That's good. So it's pretty cool. But for me, like it's important to bring those things because a part of my style is I, I really like I like using my strobes in a way that looks like natural light. Yeah. So I really like using strobes in everything I do. If you're like, if you're familiar with my work, you'll notice a lot of it kind of looks as if it's achieved through a natural way, but it's really done by strobes, and it's the only way I can really achieve that look. And like I said, I go on tour to to get the photographs that I want. So if I'm if I'm wanting to achieve the photographs I want, I need to bring my studio gear with me. So yeah, my my tour setup I guess is is quite large, but it's doable because it's quite compact. So yeah, I keep it minimal, like one body, but they're quite big, you know. Yeah, you can't put them all in the one case. Yeah, so of course. You, you just make do. And you know, if you, like I said, if you're starting out and you don't have the support of a, a band that can pay for your shipping and all that sort of stuff, well, then I guess that's a sacrifice you're going to have to make. You know, you pay an extra fifty bucks per bag, and you know, it ends up being six hundred bucks at the end of the tour to bring the lug that you know lug all that shit around the country. But I mean, I guess it's just an expense to create photographs you want to make. There's so, always a trade off. Yeah, but I don't. But then again, I don't know many photographers that bring studio lights with them around the country, let alone around the world. So, you know, each of their own. People are just happy with a camera body and a lens. So, how you know. do you? Um, what modifier do you take with you? Okay, so it's a sixty-nine inch Octabank. Sixty-nine uh, inch. Yeah. Ooh, big. Yeah, CD in it. I'm impressed. Uh, yeah, so it's a Rotoflux, uh, Rotolux uh, sixty-nine inch uh, Ellen Chrome light, and I have a modifier, a modifier for it for my uh, D D one five hundred. So. Uh, yeah, it's, how, how do you pack the um the Rotolux away? The soft box. Ah, uh, it's in a soft bag, so it goes. It, it's just a so it's like a light stand bag, and it just fits in there. So it can get crunched. It doesn't really matter because it's quite flexible. It doesn't okay. really matter how how it holds. And then like with light stands, you can also put in that bag as well, or you can you can find light stands anywhere. Yeah, so, that's true. Uh, um, if, if it ends up being an extra expense, they just get light stand in any other city because uh, sometimes people need to take advantage of the people that they know, like. Uh, it's good with Facebook and whatnot. There's like this Facebook group called Photo Friends. I'm sorry if that's like a fight club group and I've just like released a secret. That's okay. I'm in that group too. Yeah, it's cool, man. And it's a little like, uh, you, you know, if I tour the country, if I'm in Sydney, Brisbane, Melbourne, Adelaide, I can post in that group and I know someone there would have that gear and they could help me out. Yeah, so if you, can't afford, if you can't afford the shipping, then surely I can post in that group. But, you know, you can't rely on someone in that group to have a 69-inch uh, Rotolux uh, Octobank that has a modifier for your pro photo light. That's probably not going to happen. Yeah. Actually, I'll put money on and say that's not going to happen. But for the most part, things that are bulky but are accessible, so light stands and whatnot, you can afford not to take with you because chances are someone else is going to have it along the way. So, yeah. Well, here is my official offer. When you're in Melbourne, you're welcome to use my gear. Oh, beautiful. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, just... Yeah. The I've, I've only done a handful of small tours, but um, one of them was – it was the bigger one that I did and I, I really wanted to take my Alien Bees kit with me, which oh, is cool. probably a lot heavier than your f- Pro Photo kit, is it? Uh, the Alien Bees? Yeah, did you, did you say you've got a Pro Photo? I have Pro Photo Lines, yeah. Yeah, do you take a battery pack as well? Uh, oh man, I wish, no, because you can't take that on planes, man. Uh, actually, you can, but if you take the battery on the plane with you, you can't take the Pelican case, so it's one or the other. Yeah, okay. And uh, you have to remember that battery weighs a shit ton. Like you, you go over your uh, carry-on weight with the battery alone. So, well, um, I <coughs> actually with the with the alien bees, you guys have the small little suckers, don't you? The vagabond, <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're great. They're light as hell, aren't they? Yeah, it's pretty good. I don't shoot with alien bees anymore, just because you can't get them in Australia anymore. And, okay, that's and... what I was going to ask you. I was going to cut in there because sorry to sorry to everyone no, listening, no, go for but it. I'm going to I'm going to geek talk right now. 
well, when I first started investing into studio lights, um, okay, there's one brand I'm very loyal to. It's obviously Profoto. Like yep. I'm very, I'm very loyal to them. I feel like if you're going to go into studio lights, just buy the best. Mm-hmm. And it's not, it's not necessarily all about gear when it comes to cameras and stuff. But there's two things I rely heavily on, and I'm a, I'm a band, uh, I'm a band whore. Huh? I'm a brand whore for. <laughs> yeah. It's Profoto lights and Pocket Wizards. Okay, interesting. <laughs> but, but you know what? When I first started, uh, but Profotos are expensive lights. You can't, I, you can't start off using Profoto lights because. I mean, it's a big investment in something you might not like. You might not like you using studio lights. So when I first started looking, I was looking into Alien Bees. And I was like, wow, this is really cool. I want to use Alien Bees. Uh, you know, I want, to, I want to do it. I, I went to go look at bringing them into the country and you can't anymore. Yeah. It's a shame. They're the most – This, if you live in North America, and I, I'm not sure if anyone from North America will be listening to this, but if you lived in North America and you're looking at getting into studio lights, Alien Bees are the thing to do. They're, yeah, man. they're so cheap and affordable. And to pick up a battery pack for two hundred bucks to to light up your four hundred dollar lights is insane, and they offer a lot of power. Those Alien Bees, man. Yeah, I had the um, AB sixteen hundred, and I can pretty much stop down as far as I want, and I'm always going to get enough power out of that. I've I've mentioned I've I've recently had to sell it because whatever, but um, like good lights, and I think it was there used to be a importer in Brisbane that you could buy them from, and yeah. it was like less than a thousand dollars for the full kit battery pack um the head the um strobe head yep. and like a 50 inch octobox so like you can't argue with that thousand bucks yeah and, and not anymore that's that, that's what the shame is and you know what when i had my pro photo light i i you know i i don't really like sitting in the studio i like to go on location and shoot things so what do you need you need a battery pack unless you've got a hundred meter extension cable yeah you, then, you know it's not really a lot of whole lot of help but um I went to the battery pack, but to get a pro photo light battery pack cost me $2,200 for the Crazy. cheapest one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a big investment. Did I do it? Yeah, sure. Was it worth it? Okay, yeah, it was. But would I rather that or the $200 option, the, the Vegabond lithium battery thing, which works? Yeah. And I wanted that, but I could not bring it over. So when I was in America, um, when I was in America on that tour, I tried stopping. I think the guy lives in Texas or something crazy. I think so. Yeah, I think so. I went to stop. Uh, yeah, I went, he just yeah, that, passed away last week. You're kidding me. Yeah. Oh, man, that's pretty – okay, that's that's awkward. Uh, my bad. But, um, yeah, I really wanted to go see him when I was there and pick up some Vegabond, uh, Vegabond lithium batteries because they're great, but we didn't have time to stop off and pick it up there, so I was pretty bummed. Yeah, but yeah. You know what? Props to that guy because I remember when I was looking at um, the Alien Beast, he's kind of like uh, – I'm going to say this. He's kind of like the uh, the Apple computers of the lighting industry. Dude, you're not the first person to say that. He's a pioneer. And um, it's so strange. His color schemes for his lights were so ugly. Like, I actually purple, love the colored ones. Uh, Everyone bags those. Purple, I want, and, purple and gray. Who wants a purple and gray light? I wanted to Come get on. that like teal blue one anyway. Like, that's, that's uh, It's issue. disgusting. But you know what? He was very smart. Like He said, you know what? It's about the branding. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Alien beers were known for, in my opinion, disgusting colors. But you know what? He stuck true to the web. People said they weren't going to buy them purely because of the color. And he stuck true to say, well, look, it's a great product. I don't care for how it looks, you know. And, and you know, he was right. People did buy them. So, yeah, good on him for sticking true. And it's a sad it's sad what happened to him. But, um, yeah. Yeah, he, he really did turn it on its head. He basically made these really expensive, um, powerful lights available to the masses, which is – that's a pretty cool thing. Hey, I heard this funny joke on Facebook the other day. Yeah, hit me. And it's like, maybe I'm really bad at retelling jokes, so I apologize. Okay. But it's like, um, how do you know if, uh, if a photographer shoots film or uses natural light? Uh, is it when they say, oh. oh I fu- I've already fucked this joke up. I think what I meant to say was, um, you know what? Let's just skip this joke because it's horrible. I actually, but I it's know, a, it's along, I know the, it's along the lines of something where they'll tell you, and and they will. No, it's you, a, know, you know when you have like a, a person who shoots natural light or they shoot film, they'll just tell you. They'll hashtag it. I fucking hate that. You know. And you know what? The first thing I think when I when I hear someone that says they're a natural light photographer, and I'm all for it because I've been shooting a whole lot of natural light lately, uh, is that I just think that they can't use their flash or they yeah, can't use their strobes. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you're right there. Um, hey, like, don't get me that wrong. A, like, that was a bad joke. I'm really sorry, but it was, you yeah. know. I actually knew where you're going with it, so it's fine. Um, so, don't get me wrong. Listening? Um, sorry, that was a really bad joke on my end. And, uh, yeah, that was a pretty shit. I think I told the punchline before I told the joke. You're forgiven. Yeah, okay. I'll, but, yeah, I'll <laughs> don't get me wrong. I've got some 
friends doing some amazing things with natural light, but it is that that adage, that old joke, like I'm a natural light photographer. Does that mean you can't use strobes or whatever? Anyway, like I, I've heard that joke before as well. And you know what? I'm all for it. I know I know natural light photographers who don't use strobes, but they're brilliant at what they do. And that's fine. If it works for you, then whatever. Uh, but I mean, like if you had a bad experience with strobes, revisit it because I guarantee you can, you can get the same look with strobes. I promise you. I just like using strobes and you know what? Uh, it doesn't matter. You know, whatever. I like having – I'm a bit of a um, – I'm a control freak. I like to have complete control over everything I do. So for me, strobes is brilliant. I mean, I can create shadows and I can create light. Uh, I couldn't ask for any more. Yeah, it's certainly in terms of the natural light, that's certainly something I've been trying to improve because for a while I got too comfortable using strobes and I sort of fell out of the natural light groove. Um, it's definitely something I'm trying to improve at the moment as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, go for it. Go well. Cool, man. So do you have any... Do you have an app or any gadget or piece of tech that makes your life easier? Uh, Tinder's one of them. Tinder, um, yeah. No, not really. That's uh, that's actually quite interesting. It's fun when you're on tour because you can see the car, kind of people around you. Yes, uh, I've noticed bands love that. It's sort of like get to the venue, go to the toilet for a poo, jump on Tinder. Yeah, it's, it's actually. I mean, people will question it, but it's actually it's actually pretty hilarious. So there's there's two that I use actually, uh, and you know what. Oh, could I – would it be shameful if I – yeah, it would be shameful if I said it. Okay, so I'm not going to say that one. But VSCO is obviously one that I really like. Yeah. So VSCO is really cool. Um, so I have a lot of time for that. There's also this other one. If you don't know what VSCO is, it's pretty much like a plugin that emulates film for your photos. Yeah. It's kind of cool. Uh, and then another one, which is probably not all that – like it's not that – it's not a spot, you know, it's nothing new or anything, but WhatsApp is the best thing for when you're on tour. Oh, yeah. You can, you can just talk to anyone and everyone. So, uh, WhatsApp, which is probably nothing fantastic for anyone listening, that actually, you know what? The Dropbox, the Dropbox app on your phone is so good. Yeah. So good. There's nothing more than leaving your laptop at the hotel while you're uh, editing or uploading photos. And then you're on the run going somewhere out to lunch, and the manager's going, Hey, look, where's the photos? Uh, we want to upload some to socials. And you can just click on your phone and you can give them the link because it syncs straight to your phone. Yeah, fantastic. So that and VSEO, I've got all the time in the world for. Oh, and one more Uber. Can Uber, I just say okay. that is the bomb? So it probably has nothing to do with photographs whatsoever, but Uber's. Oh, one more. I've got another one. <laughs> so I'm just go, clicking go. through my phone here. Yeah, uh, go for it. I've got a light meter on my phone. And I tell you what, it's to the point. It's to the point. I put a light meter side by side to my camera and it's on the point not even yeah. like not even a stop a light out it's like maybe a quarter to half a stop a light out in yeah inaccurate but for the most part it's accurate as balls so there's this free um app called light meter download it it's so great and you know if you use strobes even if you don't use strobes light meter is fantastic i definitely recommend downloading it and if you're not familiar with light meters or what they do uh go on youtube and i get guarantee you'll find a five minute tutorial you'll download it and you'll use it i use it for everything do you so, actually Oh yeah, hundred percent. It's great. So like, uh, again, like if you're familiar with my work, I do this thing where, uh, I expose for the background. So I, I take a photo. So if I photograph someone, I photograph yeah. someone and I see I'm, I'm on location, I'll expose for the sky. So I would have my shutter on 160 because I'm shooting with flash. Um, you, to have perfect sync speed on a flash, you need to have your shutter speed on 160. Uh, and then I'll expose for the sky. So if my photo, if the sky is overexposed on 160th, I'll put up my aperture. So I'll roll, I'll roll my aperture up until it, it exposes for the sky. So say I'm at f11, right? Mm -hmm. I'm at f11. And if I were to take a photo without the flash, the subject will be a silhouette, but the sky will be perfectly exposed in the background. Yeah. Right? So I need to fill that. I need to fill the person, my subject, with with light to to make him fit, you know, exposed. So what I'll do then is. I'll dial in the settings into my light meter. I go, okay, I'm at 160th of a second. I'm at ISO 100 and I'm at aperture F11. And then it would tell me the output that I need for my flash. Oh, really? Yeah. So this is one's really cool. It, okay. Isn't every brand of flash, don't they have a different measurement? Yeah, this, one, for this the one's output? different because this one has the settings for the flashes. So this is great. So it's got like pro photo. It has pro photos, 500. Oh, wow, it has, okay. even has the watt output. So it's fantastic. And it'll tell you. The, uh, the power you need to display at. So it's really, it's really cool. And you know what? Even uh, this one, this one's free as well. But even if you just had an, art, an, an old school light meter, yeah. even if you had an old school light meter, you can go, okay, I'm at 160th of a shutter, I'm at F11, 
mm, let me do the math here. How many, how many stops of light do I need to overpower that? And you do the math, like, you know, you do the math, you go, okay, 2.8, 5.6, okay, 1, 2, 3, 4. You know, actually, I'll tell you one thing right now. If you're listening and you don't know your stops of light, go onto YouTube right now and type in Zach Arias stops of light. And you'll learn this equation on how to read stops of light and how many stops of light you need to fill in your silhouettes. Yep, and it's, yep. it is the best thing you ever learn. You won't ever need a light meter after that. But you know what? Sometimes if you're having a really bad day and you're really tired and you're grumpy like me, which is all the time, and you can't be <laughs> effed doing the math, yeah. you get the light meter out and you do it and it's brilliant. Yeah, because so. I was going to say, like, I've never even considered using a light meter because I feel like it only takes a couple of shots looking at the back of the camera to get there but i guess if you can like literally take a reading and it tells you what to punch in on your light that sounds valuable uh yeah for sure and you know what like with the camera uh with the, with the camera the problem with the camera is when you read the light meter on the camera it like you can do you can do it so it's um it has a single point focus where it reads the light but for the most part it just pretty much reads the whole scene whereas a light meter will literally read what's in front of it so if, if you've got your light meter right on your subject it's gonna read. It's gonna expose just for that. Okay. So uh, I think light meters still have uh, a place. And if you go on eBay and you type in light meters, they're not dropping. They're, they're, the prices of those things aren't dropping to the floor because digital's now taken over. They're going through the roof because people want them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's uh, iconic or whatever it is. Yeah, they're great. So. Um, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Well, that. I guess that that must be part of the way that you are able to execute because the photos. I've noticed from your photos with strobes, it's not just with my photos, I don't just expose for the background. I underexpose the background in most of them, mm -hmm. which is because I like that really deep contrast. But yep. yours, you mentioned that the effect that you go for, and now that you say it, I can notice it in every photo, is you like to make it look like you've used natural light where you've used a strobe. So yeah, the contrast so is a lot more subtle. Um, obviously, there's a lot more technique involved. Is that, does the light meter help achieve that? Oh, yeah, 100%. Because like I said, like, uh, you've got to expose for that subject, and you don't you don't want to over. Okay, like you can just you can you can guess it, and you and, and in a couple of strobes or test shots and you know trials, you can find the correct exposure on your light. But sometimes you just want to do it right away, and it gets you in a good habit of just nailing it down the first time. Yeah. So okay. like when you and when you start shooting uh, bigger and better bands, and you have time restraints, say you got like five minutes or fifteen minutes to photograph a band. You, you start running out of time trying to figure out, okay, is this perfect exposure, whatever, whatever. It's just so easy to get a light meter, light meter out, go pop, okay, I've got the reading, and you can start shooting straight away from the first click, you know what the photo's going to look like. So, Okay, I'm writing that down. <coughs> light meter app. All right, we're all learning. Mm, it's good. Um, all right, man. Well, that was, that was all I was going to do for today, but seeing as you've you've listened to the other episode, which I'm really appreciative for, and, and you've thought about an answer, I'll find the, um, the $500 question. Wild. I'll cut all this stuff out. I actually don't know where it is, so I'll ask it from memory. Mm. All right, so the final question is, let's say you're starting from scratch. You're in a new country. You've got $500 in your pocket and a lens and a body and a laptop. What do you do in the first month to start again, um, whether it's to build back to what you have or to take your business in the new direction. <clears throat> well, I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna take this into a perspective of rebuilding a business altogether. So I'm a new photographer. Um, it doesn't like okay. I'm a new photographer in my current city. I'm a new photographer in a different city. Whichever doesn't matter. I'm yep. a nobody. So like, uh, you need to create a, a niche for. Uh, well, this is what I'll do. I'll build a basic WordPress site. Uh, I'd find a basic template website I could store my photographs on, something simple. Uh, it should have an about me section, uh, a contact page, and I would have, say, your phone number. Make sure the area code's in that because there's so many photographers I know that don't put an area code oh, in. Yeah, yeah, true. It's so important to have an area code in. Trust me, you have all people of all sorts trying to contact you. And I'll have a domain and an email address, which would cost me five bucks. So there's nothing more important than being professional. Yeah. So to have so, so WordPress is free essentially. Yeah, WordPress is free. So you already you've already got the basics for free. You got it. You got a basic template website you can build for free just to have your photographs on. Doesn't have to be. You don't have to spend thousands of dollars on a designer. Yeah. Something something simple. Remember, just find it's a about, free template. It's so, about the photos. Yep. Yep. And it has an about me and a contact page. Okay. And then I would purchase a domain which costs five dollars through GoDaddy. You can have your own email address. So mine's max at maxfairclo.com. Yep. 
It looks better than Fairy Girl sixty nine at yahoo.com. <laughs> yeah, Trust kid. me, like it kills me. People still have Gmail accounts. And oh, all hotmail, my, man. Hotmail. All, people all my good use. friends still have Gmail accounts. Maybe you have a Gmail account. I don't know. But I think I think it's so important for branding purposes to have uh, to have a, your own domain. It just looks serious, and it only costs you five dollars. So whatever, it's the rain. But I just think that's what I would do. Yeah. Uh, then I'd find your niche. So whether it's weddings, portraits, products, headshots, editorial, advertising, corporate, commercial, fine art, landscapes, whatever. <laughs> There are a lot of things you can do as a working photographer, you know? So like I think, and I was saying this before, a trap emerging photographers do is try to capture everything. Mm-hmm. If you're starting yourself out and you want to capture everything, you don't have all the time in the world to create a solid portfolio. You're in a new city with $500. Like I reckon you have a better chance of going to the casino and rolling that on black, trying to make money doing that than, you know, trying to capture everything and trying to create a portfolio. Right. You're going to make nothing out of that. Yeah, yeah. So. At least you've you got know, half a chance to make your money. Back. Exactly. So don't take a shotgun blast approach <clears throat> to marketing your own business. Try and find a niche. Stay focused on one or two things. <clears throat> um, if you can be comfortable, like I said, in doing you know what you want to photograph that you love, you know you can find success in it. So I think definitely by no means, um, I just just target the things that you love. I, I think is is the best thing I can probably ask for. Yeah. Uh, and like I said, you know. If you go to Google, say your name, it will come up with PJ Pentelis and then whatever you specialize in. Yeah. So just find just find one thing. If you're in a new city, just be that guy. You want to be the promo photographer? Be the promo photographer. Don't be the guy that captures everything. I sure. promise you, you're going to find a harder time getting work. <clears throat> so then like when you find your niche, uh, you need to build a portfolio, right? Mm-hmm. So you're a wedding photographer, you're a portrait photographer, whatever. Let's say in my example, because it's something I know, um, I'm a music photographer, right? <clears throat> So when you know your when you know your niche, shoot your friends or your clientele for free. Now, before I get good for that, uh, it's quite, it's pretty interesting because when I first started taking photos in Perth of the the local bands, uh, the only types of photographs I could find of the bands were in alleyways, promo shots of solo you know solo artists walking down the road with a guitar case, oh, you know man, that sort of instruments stuff. Instruments in band promos. You know what? That was cool in '73 when Neil Young was doing <laughs> it, but it's not cool anymore. Yeah. And you know what? I, I feel like as as photographers, and we are photographers, we are problem solvers, and you know. As a photographer, I think hand in hand you should be called a creative. Um, I feel like we could, you know, I, I at least could offer something new. Yeah. So <clears throat> I built a portfolio of photographs of local bands that was something different that I could work off of. And, you know, I went to local shows and I got to meet people. Um, I wouldn't actually try to meet bands and make those photos happen. I would try and meet people who knew, you know, 10 bands or, you know, the, the people that can make me know other people. So, you know, the managers, publicists, whoever. Um, you know, instead of randomly trying to find apples spread across the field, you'd go and try and find, you know, you'd go and try and find the apple tree. Go you know what I'm saying? Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Go, go straight to the source who can help you, not just one, get 10. Speak to the manager, ask, you know, ask what they look for in a photo. <clears throat> you got to see what the managers want, see, you know, see what they want, see what, see what will make you get a job. What, what are they looking for? Are they looking for hands in their pockets? You know, what do they like in a promo photo? Make, you know, you're going to make it known that you're interested in what they want so they appreciate you more as a photographer and that you're willing to do what it takes. To, to give you what they want. So, you know, take them to lunch, make an impression. And you know what? I, I'll get grilled for saying this, but shoot for free. You know, I think we all have to start from somewhere and people forget that. You can't put a price on something when you suck. You're worth free. You're a nobody. You have no name. Nobody knows nothing about you. You're in a new city. You have a basic portfolio. In my opinion, you are free. You're you gotta worth free. It. Yeah, you're worth free. You haven't built value yet. Um, I would shoot for free. I would meet managers, take them out for coffee, like I said, take them out for lunch. And then I'll tell them, send me five bands my way. I'll shoot them for free in the next 30 days. So okay. you have a time frame in which you need a solid portfolio. You're running out of time. 30 days to shoot five solid bands. And I just wouldn't shoot anyone for free. I would shoot bands that play on Saturday nights, the headline acts, you know, local shows that have a bit of a rapper. So when people see the photos, they go, oh, okay, I kind of know that band. And it's not about, it's not all about who's in the photographs, but sometimes it, it, it is. But you have to make sure you capture them in good light. So it's important you shoot the bands that do mean something a little bit because at the same time, you're making a connection there by building uh, a relationship with them by taking their free photo. Yeah, so absolutely. I would shoot them uh, and I would shoot them and I'll build a strong portfolio within the next 30, you know, next 30 days. And once I have that portfolio, I'll sell myself to the clientele that actually going to pay me. So uh, for example, I'm a music photographer. Cool. So I would approach local bands and, you know, I'll start the payroll happening. Um, and, you know, people will say, you know, like uh, local bands, they make no money. Well, you know what? I guarantee you they have tens of thousands of dollars of equipment on stage. And I'm not to say just because they have thousands of dollars on stage, uh, thousand, thousands of dollars of equipment on stage that they can afford to pay me. That's not the case. But uh, to put into perspective, uh, how many photographers do you know that make no money or always complain they're broke, they're getting no jobs, but they have a 5D Mark III 
a new $2,000 lens and they have a new MacBook Pro. All of them. Yeah, exactly. You know why? Because we spend <laughs> money on what we value. And yeah. what you have to do as a photographer is spend, um, is build value for your work. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you want bands to pay you, they'll pay you. But you've got to make your work worth something. So you've got to make your work that $4,000 guitar. But your work's not $4,000. Your work is $200. You know, it's not a whole lot of money. But you've got to make your, your work value to them. Yeah. So, yeah, your new $2,000 lens, a new MacBook Pro, it means something to us and we're willing to spend the money on it because we value it. Yeah. Right? So, um, and as I said, you know, everyone's a photographer. You're a photographer. We're all part of the oversaturation market. You have to build value for what you do. The type of the work you create, the experience you give, and how you treat your clients is the impression you give. And, that, and that's all I can really ask for. If you move into a new city, that's all you can ever do. So <clears throat> get your camera body, start taking photos of friends, build a portfolio, and roll in the work. There, there is really no secret method to that. Send a shit ton of emails, 20 emails a day, do something mental. It, it, you know, and there's really no secret on who to, in, you know, and who to talk to when you're trying to make these jobs happen. Because the people that you want to talk to are so accessible. You know, okay, uh, I want to photograph so-and-so. I guarantee you if you go on their Facebook page and you check the About Me section, they will probably have a general manager or an artist manager's email there. I guarantee you. And Some they, point of contact, right? Yeah. And if they don't have that, then they have the label or management's website. So you go on the website and there will be a contact page on there. And it might not have the artist's, uh, the manager's exact email address there. It might just have the office email. But send your request in an email to the office and ask, and ask to be directed to someone who could accommodate your request. Yeah. And you, I, it's a lot of emails and you'll get a lot of knockbacks, but for the one chance that you do get an email back, that's a possible tour or a possible opportunity to increase your portfolio or a possible time to get paid. Okay, so, right. yeah, build, build, build a portfolio. I cannot stress that enough. And, um, you know, cross your fingers and uh, just hope you get a response with your emails. And, you know, again, if you present good work, I have no doubt you'll get knocking on your door. So, Well, yeah. to anyone listening to this, Max has just shared – an incredible amount of value. If you've been waiting to get into this sort of thing or you've been making excuses like my lenses aren't good enough, I don't have the connections, it's a it's an exclusive Cool Kids Club, Max has literally just outlined your entire first month. So what's your excuse now? Like he's already- I, I, I promise you, I, my whole website, when I, when I got that, when the, when the biggest tours I got, my whole website was built on promo photos shot with an 18 to 55 plastic kit lens. That's what I was going to so, say. You've already And you know said- what's funny? We, we, we shoot with high-res cameras now, but we're trying to shoot them and emulate them to have grain in it so it looks like film. So really, so it right. does, has nothing to do with the quality of the camera nowadays. Just yeah. produce the quality of work. So yeah. you're right. You you've can already hustle said- your way to the top. You know? You've already said earlier that you shot most of your gigs in those days on a crop sensor, albeit oh, yeah. like a four-year-old, five-year-old crop sensor these days, kit lens. And when you think about it, every single billboard shot you know, before this moment in time, we shot on worse cameras than we have today. So, like, there's no excuse to get into my, it. Well, my old man shot a cricket billboard with a 7 megapixel camera. It was the Canon 1D at the time when it first went digital. It was, I think it was 7 or 8 megapixels on a billboard. There you go. That's like there you go. That's like one-fifth of what we're shooting today. It's crazy. And don't get me wrong, high-resolution cameras, they, they, I, lo- I love them because I can do a lot more with my work. But that doesn't mean you can't create a portfolio based on it. It does not mean you can create stunning photos. So uh, that doesn't you really mean you no, can't hustle with what you got. You have no excuse. If you've got a five fifty D or some shitty little camera and a plastic lens, who cares? Go out there, shoot your friends, build a portfolio, learn your work, go on YouTube, learn tutorials, everything's on the internet. Every, everything you want to learn can be accessed on the internet. Just go out and do it. You you're really just being complacent if you're saying you can't do it. So um, yeah. Max, thank you so, so much. This has been an absolute marathon call. I didn't expect it to go this long, but yeah. your, your conversations flow very, very easily. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm sorry I'm a bit of a chatterbox. I just, no, no, uh, that's perfect. I, I just like to talk, yeah. Yeah, dream guest. Okay, so where can we send people to connect with you or to check out your stuff online? Yep, so if you just type in my name into Google, so it's Max Fackler, you can find my Instagram, uh, my website, or me on Facebook, either or. Uh, I guess Instagram's probably my most active one. Yeah. Uh, but you know what? Either or, if you want to check out my work, it's on my website, and you can see everything on my website and on my Instagram and my Facebook. Everything's linked to one another. Or if you just want to drop, you know, send me a message on Facebook and we can talk, we can do that. So, uh, yeah, just type in my name and I'm sure you'll find it. <laughs> yeah, and I'll link up all the spelling and stuff in the show notes for this page. If you enjoyed this episode, episode, make sure you get in touch with Max and say thank you, say what's up, thank you for the content the valuable information thank you so much my friend we'll have to do an update sometime in the future because i can tell you've got so much knowledge to share
Uh, let's. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thanks, Thanks man. Take care. I'll talk to you next time. Bye. This has been a super long episode. And if you made it to the very end, I just wanted to say thank you so much for sticking with it. Max has so much to share. He's a really passionate guy and I really appreciate that he doesn't hold back. Personally, I got a whole lot out of this session, much more than I expected to. And it's something that I wish I had one or two years ago. The cool thing about this sort of content is that even though it's so long, you don't have to give it your undivided attention. You can download it on your phone or whatever device you have. You can listen at the gym while you're running around the block, while you're driving in the car. You can literally be learning and consuming content while you're doing something else completely productive. I like to listen in the car and when I'm editing photos. If you enjoyed this longer episode, I would love it if you would head over to the website and leave a comment below the post just to say thanks to Max. While you're there, I have a bunch of other cool content that I think you're going to love, including a free ebook which outlines exactly what you need to get started in band pro and photography. Punch in your email address and I'll send it right to you. In case you forgot, it's bigpantsphoto.com slash podcast. Thanks again for listening. I really appreciate you. Subscribe on iTunes if you like the show. That really helps me and leave me a review. Until next time, happy shooting. See you later. Bye.